I am live. We are live. Yes. And I'm excited to be back. It is episode, what is this, seven? We have one for every day of the week, uh, and that is Chatting with Nuts. That's me, your host here at the Fantasy Network, Jimmy Nuts. Uh, I'm excited to be back, and it's good to see all of you. And tonight, my guest is someone I've had on the channel for some spoiler discussions uh, involving a certain author named Robin Hobb that I happen to be pretty fond of as, as does yeah. my guest. And uh, yeah, my guest is Jake Bishop. Jake, how are you? I'm good. I'm excited to be on the world famous show, Chatting with Nuts, uh, the legendary podcast that. Uh, anyway, I, I'm just wait, waiting for like to be famous based on being on this show, but we'll see how that goes. Well, I did uh, send a tweet out, so hopefully people see that at least. <laughs> yeah, I, hopefully I don't get like spammed with notifications asking for my autograph while this is live. But yeah, you're going to be fine. asked for feet pictures. There's no doubt about that. Oh, yeah. My audience really likes feet. I, I don't understand why. Um, um okay. <laughs> I probably should have been, you should not, this maybe you should probably warn your guests about this before that you have them mm -hmm. on, but whatever. It's the genuine reaction of being creeped out that they're, that people are really into, I think. So, uh, oh, okay. And of course, my mother is here. Mama Nuts uh, is here. Hi, mom. Good to see you. <laughs> uh fantasy bobble always good to see a warm emperor since when uh not sure what you're referring to warm emperor unless if i miss something but yeah we'll, we'll have uh some time here for people to roll in how's your week been jake you've, you've been good week's been pretty good yeah you know normal stuff um read read, read quite a bit because i started project hail mary and then couldn't stop reading project hail mary oh how was um, it it was really good um video will be coming up about it soon um it was way more than I expected it to be. I was expecting just high stakes The Martian. I haven't even read The Martian. I will now. Um, it's okay. one of those books that's so hard to talk about spoiler free because the entire reason it's like incredible is kind of a spoiler, but it was one of those unput downable books I've read. I read it in like 24 hours. Um, unput downable. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I read it in 24 hours and I started it at 1 a.m. and then I had work. How so, many pages is it? Uh, like 400 and something. I mean, that's no joke, dude. Yeah, I was, it was, it, it, I read that fast. Um, I couldn't not read it fast. Wow. Um, yeah, I would I, recommend. So you've never read the Mar. I read the Martian. I listened to the Martian back when I was a pro wrestler and I was traveling the roads and doing my thing, brother. Uh, I, I used to listen to audiobooks a lot of the time. Uh, and at the time I was listening to more like physics books, but I said, this is fiction, but it kind of pertains to physics and, and I'll do that. Uh, cause I was a physics student then and I loved the Martian and the Martian actually kind of kickstarted me back into looking into fantasy. And then shortly after I read the dark tower book one and stopped there for that time. But I love The Martian from Andy Weir. And I've heard that Hail, Project Hail Mary is super good. I've heard it has a lot of the same kind of feel think, to it as The Martian. Yeah, I mean, the protagonist is like Space MacGyver again. But I mean, I who mean, doesn't he, love Space MacGyver? Yeah, he does a really good job of writing Space MacGyver. Um, also, I haven't read The Martian, but apparently like the structure of the pacing mm -hmm. um, is very like reminiscent in terms of like when things get fast, when things go terribly things go terribly a lot you know it's like yeah. the martian um but i mean i haven't i definitely am going to read the martian now because of how good uh project hail mary was but i would very much recommend it i'm curious to see if if anyone in the chat knows i'm, I'm very curious to see if uh andy Weir used the same narrator from the martian uh i can't remember who it was it's probably someone very obvious uh but back then i wasn't paying attention to those type of things I absolutely love the audiobook. So I'll probably do Project Hail Mary as an audiobook. Um, I, I definitely want to get to that, though. I, it's, it's really exciting that you liked it so much. Oh, yeah. It, I, my expectations were pretty high. There's some people who tend to have the same book opinions as me on Discord. And there's also two people who like like totally different things in books and tend to disagree. And they both kind of overlap with half of my opinions. And they both loved it. So wow. I figured, you know, it has to be good because... They're kind of, you know, so I, it doesn't make sense for both of them to love a book that's bad because they like opposite things. So um, I, think that, I think that's actually really interesting is uh, just the sole fact that you have people that, you know, based on their opinion is so opposite of you that you're going to actually enjoy what they <laughs> what Well, they neither hate. of them are totally opposite to me. It's that mm -hmm. they both kind of if you look at the books I like, they both kind of agree with me 
about half the time and they agree on opposite things. Like we agree on opposite series. Um, so, and kind of for very different reasons, but yeah. when both like it, it usually means it's going to have great characters, good writing, well-paced and have like really interesting science fiction or magic related stuff and mm -hmm. world building. So it's more, it's more that they weigh things with a more higher importance. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Then maybe you do that, those type of things. So that's, that's actually pretty interesting. I like that. Um, let's see. Same, but not RC Bray did the Martian in project Hail Mary, but they re-recorded the Martian with Will Wheaton. Okay. I think I listened to the Will Wheaton, uh, probably definitely did, uh, based on that message, but good to know. Very good to know. Hello from the UK. It's late here and I'm sleeping, but it's good to hear you guys. VMB 66. We're glad to have you. I, I, I speak for Jake as well um, as his guardian here on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that, but OK. Well, it's official. I signed the papers today. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, I don't get told stuff, apparently. Well, you know, we, we weren't sure how to break it to you. When I say we, I mean the YouTube gods. Oh, OK. Yes. Um, Shad said, Hey guys, how's it going? It's going good. Uh, apparently Jake had some great reading done this week. What else, what else were you reading other than project Hail Mary? Cause yeah, there it is. Is that the UK edition? Yes. I have the entire series in the UK edition. Same. Because, I, those are on the uh, way. I have the rest in the UK version. Yeah. So I, because good. the U S versions are not great. There's a, there's uh, a couple that are okay later down the road. But they I haven't all... looked at any of the later ones because, I mean, I don't look at the covers of the late books in case they had like any spoilers on them. But okay. I'm sure some of them are less terrible. But yeah, yeah, there's some OK ones. I think the UK, the fact that it's a matching set that are all great. I mean, you can't beat that. You really yeah. Can't. I also they read really nicely as well. Like the spine is really good. Yeah. Um, they don't close. They all have like good margins on the outside. They're just nice paperbacks yeah they're they're about as as perfect of a size paperback as i've ever seen too uh i i sometimes like the john gwen floppy paperback i love them but sometimes they are a little bit difficult to read especially in bed i feel like all the hob uk editions just fit my hand perfectly yeah i mean in general like i like the bigger books when i'm reading at home and then but if i'm going somewhere obviously it's kind of a pain to you know, take around, let's say I'm reading Rhythm of War. That's kind of not super fun to bring around the hardcover Rhythm of War places. Um, yeah, these are a really good combination of both. So, yeah, I'd agree with that. And, and the, like you said, I like the spines. They don't seem to crack, but they do bend very well. Or if they crack, it doesn't show as much as yeah. all of the other books. That glossy finish, you know, that they put on like the Malazan uh, mass market paperbacks. Oh, yeah. The Malazan um, spines crack so easily. Yeah. Um, really pathetically easily. I think I think Malazan. I always say Malazan first, and then I correct myself. A uh, Malazan paperbacks. I feel like it's from frustration. Like they know that you're gonna get mad, so you're, you you want to bend the book out of pure frustration of not understanding what's going on. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's definitely um, some anger while reading Hob books, but it's usually at the people inside. Yeah, um, I, I said that today. I said I've never read an author. Uh, that has made me put the book down on my lap and look at the ceiling and yell fuck more than Robin. <laughs> yeah. I've never actually thrown a book across the room, but the closest I've come is in ship of destiny. Yeah. I, I threw a uh, will of Ascension across my couch and then considered uh, kicking it out my window. Cause I hated it so much, but that's a, that's a story for another time. Uh, it looks like a lot of people in here are reading Robin Hobb as well. Warm Emperor mentioned he's reading the same book as you. Uh, Shad Zaman says reading Fool's Fate. I just wrapped that up last week. It was awesome. Head Cannon's not a big fan of breaking spines. Yeah, I love trade paperback. Yes, trade paperbacks are my preferred way, unless it's Stormlight Archive. I gotta say, I have the trade paperbacks and I have rid of them a war and hardback. The hardback with the art. Yeah, the hardback, the, the art makes it worth it. Also, I see Naminton, who I'm assuming is the next comment who's gonna come up here, read Tigana yes. and loved it. So good stuff. Love yeah. that book. Yeah, if anyone in the chat and anyone listening is very uh, interested or it hasn't quite picked up Guy Gavriel K yet, who for all intents and purposes is kind of like a almost like a spiritual successor to J.R.R. Tolkien, not because of the themes that he goes with, but just the amazing prose. And I mean, it's beautiful writing uh, from what I've seen. Jake has a Tagana review that I thought was the best Tagana review that I've seen. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's one of your strong suits is that you go into the long form and I never realize that your videos are like 
20 to 40 minutes because I'm enjoying it so much. And I think you pull out a lot of really good analogies and Tagana uh, and Ship of Magic as well. But Tagana was a really good example of that. And it shot it. It was already pretty high on my TBR, to be honest. Uh, but you kind of made it push it to the forefront. It's like one of those ones I'd like to sneak in before the end of the year. But if you haven't seen the Tagana review on Jake's channel, go over, check it out. Also hit subscribe. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Anyway, now I'm the same, but now I'm like, oh, I got to read more Guy Gavriel K, but I, there's so many books. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, hopefully I can get to more K because damn, that man can write. Yeah, I've heard it's amazing. Um, Elena says, I bought Mistboard Era 1 in UK paperbacks and then couldn't read them because couldn't open them without breaking the spine. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And she is listening to Royal Assassin. So happy to finally be reading Hob Royal Assassin. Our good friend Alex just reviewed it today and said it might be the best book he's read all year. For me, it's in contention for best book of the year. I'm trying to see if there's any recency bias with Fool's Fate. I think Fool's Fate's going to win out in the end, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I like Fool's Fate more, but um, yeah, yeah. Al Alex's review was great. Um, yeah, obviously. Good. But, you know, what a, what's a, what a coincidence. We have lots of people reading Robin Hobb books and also lots of people reading really good books. Hmm. <laughs> I, I like the uh, correlation we have going on here. Sir Hat says, hey, finally catching one of these live streams, 140 AM over here. I appreciate you being a trooper <laughs> and staying up. I, You know, it's not that I don't want to be more time zone, uh, you know, uh, to cater to more time zones. It's just the fact of when I have time and it happens to be Friday nights. So, yeah. Uh, also, I mean, night. no matter what you do, it's going to be a bad time zone for someone. It's true. It is true. And, and uh, you know, I also have to consider uh, my wife and, and make sure that I get to see her uh, on some sort of weekend uh, night. Right. And spend some time together. So uh, Noel Novel says, I feel like I should go ahead and order the rest of the realm of the Elderlings because it took so long to get the far trilogy. Yes. So here's here's Noel. I'm going to paint you with a picture. And I was telling Jake this before we went live. When you get the book two or whatever trilogy or series you're in in realm of the elderlings go ahead and order the next books and they'll arrive like right when you finish and it's yeah that's, that's not what i did after farseer i just ordered everything yeah i read assassin's apprentice i was like all right let's order the next two in farseer read farseer and i was like okay we'll just order all of them um and so now i've had all of them yeah they're gonna look good on my shelf i can't wait for the final three to arrive i really can't i get them from book depository and uh I yeah, like the fact that they package them individually and i've never had a damaged book from book depository so so it's a lot better than Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of the other big uh, shippers. I know Book Deposit is owned by uh, Book Depository is owned by Amazon, but but they do a better job of shipping. It was funny. I accidentally ordered two of one Hob book, and the two uh, the one Hob book I accidentally ordered two of was Dragon Keeper. Oh, I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that, my friend. Yeah, it's my least favorite Hob book, oh. and I randomly have two of it anyway. Uh, for some clarification, Headcan said, no, I meant it as a way to describe spines, the ones where they can bend without having visible break marks. I would call them bend, but don't break spine. I see. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's exactly how the UK editions. Uh, that's kind of what me and Jake were saying. They're awesome. I've read Tagana. I really enjoyed it. I'm hoping to read them. Cool. Okay, is amazing. Finished last light of the sun last week. Slowly making my way through all his books. I think I saw your review on Goodreads if we're friends on there. I feel like I remember seeing that, but. I'm not sure. <laughs> Just finished Fool's Fate and cried several times. All the feels. I'm not going to lie. I shed some tears during Fool's Fate. Oh, yeah. Same. I shed some tears. Uh, I mean, I'm honestly impressed by that person's like emotional resilience to be like doing things <laughs> after having <laughs> just finished Fool's Fate. I mean, Fool's Fate was a book I literally sat down. Like, I'd get to a point. I'm like, I'm going to read the rest of it. And I'd get to a, you know, a, a very emotional part. And I would just sit it down and be like, all right, we'll get them back tomorrow. I can't do this all tonight. Yeah, I remember you like you were messaging me like, I don't know if I can go on with like 50 pages left. And I'm like, oh, you got to. Yeah. Can't this, stop now. That's the thing about Tawny, man, is it comes to such a great ending. Uh, and if, if you missed it on Wednesday night, I did a Tawny Man spoiler discussion with Chris Bookish Cauldron and Rhythma. And it, it's on the channel. It's only about an hour and 36 minutes. I say only. But uh, that book has so much content in it. And we did miss some stuff um like we didn't talk about the well i can't say it never mind but we we missed a pretty big character towards the end of the book uh but if you want to go check that out make sure to check it out because tawny man in my opinion the reason why i had such a hard time even beginning rainwall chronicles is the fact that tawny man ends perfectly yeah she, like she if there had not. never been i mean, so there would be the fits story i feel like could end with tawny man yeah there would be some questions about what was going on for like the lot the stuff that 
for like the end of live ship. Yes. So I feel like what I suspect, I obviously I haven't finished the last trilogy is that in terms of a finale for like the entire world fits in the fool will be the better end point. But like, if all you cared about was Fitz and you're an airsick lowlander who doesn't like live ship, then it would be basically a perfect way to end. Storm and lowlanders, my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> those damn airsick lowlanders, you know. Oh man, yeah. Tony Man just ended on such a note that I, I actually considered taking a break from Realm of the Elderlings after Tony Man. I thought about taking six months and being like, let it wash out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just so overwhelmingly emotional for, in, in good ways too, by the way, uh, I said this in my review. I think we talk a lot about how Robin Hobb destroys us, but she also lifts us up quite a bit. And I find her to give us very uh, tiny shreds of hope through the damage that comes with living a life. So yes, for sure. Um, if it was, we, we say it's all pain, but if it was literally all pain, we probably wouldn't read it. So uh, I, I actually like this GGK Hop Tab Williams Rufos or like the fantasy Mount Rushmore uh, pros Mount Rushmore. I'm actually uh, working who, on a video. Who's the bass player for that Rushmore? Well, this is Mount Rushmore, right? So this. Oh is... yeah. Oh sorry, that was a joke. So the icon that there was someone who said like if Rushmore was a band, Teddy Roosevelt would play bass. So I I, I think you. of it as a band, which is totally true. All right. Um, that's fair. So if if you take uh, anyways, if that was a band of prose writers, sorry, I skipped a linking thing in my brain there. If that was a band, which of those writers is the bass player? Yeah, I'm actually it's funny that you br bring this up, uh, Vanya, yeah, because I am working on a video of my Mount Rushmore fantasy and I kind of want to start it as a tag and then tag people in it. So uh, be on the lookout for that. It's, it's something I've been wanting to do for a while, but I kind of want to do it not like just me in front of the camera. I want to like edit it and make it nice. So we'll see how it, if that goes Ryan Turbush, my man, the best way to start a weekend full of fancy sci-fi rating is to catch chatting with nuts on a Friday evening. That is right. My friend, <laughs> that is right. Um, and also I, yes, head cannon. That is where I got that from. You are correct. That man. that's where that, that's where that came from. I used anyway. to watch those all the time. I haven't seen those in, in many years. Vanya says, yeah, me neither, but I randomly remember stuff from them. Anyway, wow, this is the drummer. <laughs> oh yeah. I would love to do a fan stick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whenever I finally get that video out, I will definitely uh, give you a tag. In. <laughs> oh. hey, we got Alan in the chat. All right. So I guess if Alan's here, we can talk about it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you saw, but this week we got huge news and it's very important news. So one half of the Expanse authors is Daniel Abraham. He's been an assistant to George R. R. Martin for many, many years, has two amazing fantasy series called The Long Price Quartet and The Dagger and the Coin. And he is releasing a new book in February 2022. It's a new fantasy series, a book one. The cover was awesome. They need to shrink the font a little bit. And I believe it was called The Ashes of Sand. I might be. I think I'm wrong. I think I'm wrong. What, what's the new Daniel Abraham book titled? I have no idea. I haven't read any any Daniel Abraham. I'm Aww. ashamed to say. So I'm. Wait, uh, you've never read The Expanse at all either? No, I'm starting that. It's a 2022. Okay. Plan. Okay. I'm Googling Age of Ashes. I, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to Google. I just went back. Alan has the answers. Yes. <laughs> and he is excited. So am I. Uh, we, we actually DM'd after we saw that. And like, uh, you know, he hasn't read the dagger in the coin. I haven't read the long, long price quartet. So we need to like switch it. You know, I need to read that. And he needs to read the dagger in the coin. Uh, Jake, you're going to love uh, at least the dagger in the coin. And I think yeah. you'll love the expanse. I need well. to read all of Abraham his stuff he sounds uh very very promising um yeah. alan definitely has me hyped for the long price quartet um i know some people other people who both love both long price quartet and dagger in the coin actually i can't think of anyone i know who's read both which is kind of funny yeah um, yeah i actually agree with you i don't know anybody that's read both <laughs> yeah uh alan or jimmy one of you needs to read the other so you can actually be the person who's read both. It's a race. I think Alan's going to beat me because I'm super committed right now to the Dark Tower and Realm of the Elderlings. But as soon as I'm done, I might try to sneak it in this year. I, I had no plans of it, uh, but I do feel like I need to complete all of his prior works before reading book one of his new, uh, his new series. And apparently it's, it's March. Um, and Elena adores The Expanse and really need to read Abraham series as well. Yeah, uh, I can't tell you how much i love dagger in the coin i think it's the most underrated fantasy series of all time 
Uh, I'm reading Dragon's Path this month, Jimmy. Let's go, Alan. Let's go. Great book swap. Uh, Jake, I, I, yeah, I agree with Alan here. He says, I think Jake would love long, long price quartet because of his love of awesome characters. I kind of feel the same way about the dagger and the coin. Uh, a lot of people are like, oh, he's probably just like Germ. He's not. He subverts like fantasy tropes in a way that is not like the way Germ does it. He has his own spin. Like he clearly loves that, like to go against the grain. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But he does it in a way that's very unique to him. And I think that's what makes him very special. His main protagonist in The Dagger and the Coin is essentially a girl, an orphan girl who grows up as an amazing banker. She just has a knack for banking, but she also happens to become an alcoholic. Oh, that's not exactly typical, but that's interesting. It's very, dude, it's really good. Uh, her name is Kithrin, and she's like probably in my top 10 all time character list. Oh, yes. Ooh like she's good she's and then good. yeah and i know alan mentioned he had like his top 10 characters video and he mentioned like uh long price quartet you know people over like 40 years which obviously immediately reminded me of realm of the elderlings yeah um and i'm a big fan of it here and um i mean a little bit dresden as well so dresden's gonna be like i don't know 17 books and it's almost a book a year so we've had i've known dresden from like the age of 24 to 40 um wow and like, it's kind of, you know, you don't see him for the entire year. You see his worst weekend of every year. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see Alan saying in the chat that long price quartet follows those characters 48 years of life. I love that kind of stuff. I love yeah, me too. with the character. I mean, th th there's a big payoff in, in something like that when it's done really well. Um, and we have Leslie from the nerdy narrative. My good friend. How's the weather in Florida? Um, here, a lot of cicadas. Not great. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have those. Yeah, uh, you're so lucky. She she's hyped up about the Dark Tower. Yeah, I need to get a spoiler discussion going for the Dark Tower. Now, Jake, I think you have not started the Dark Tower, but it's something you're interested in. Right? I'm going to read it eventually. Um, I was uh, going to read it earlier. So the only King book I've read is The Stand because everyone talked about how great it was. And I'm not a huge fan of The Stand. So that kind of made me slightly less enthusiastic for Dark Tower. Hmm. Without, without um, spoilers, what was it about The Stand that you disliked? It was so the stand, even though I thought the characters were very good and the mm -hmm. premise was very good, I was basically lukewarm on literally everything else. Um, so I, I wasn't a fan of his writing style, um, where it felt like things would be almost like not connected, where it'd just be like missing a linking sentence between stuff. Um, and I kind of feel like it's split into three books. Um, mm -hmm. and I feel like if you I have different issues with each of the three books, but like if you published it as a trilogy, I would have significant issues with all three books. The first one is because I get annoyed when the first uh, chapter from like every point of view uh, just starts with them thinking about their backstory for four pages. And I'm just like, oh, come on. We're yeah. going to do this again. And there's so many characters and you get to another one and it's like, all right, four pages of them thinking about their backstory. Great, great, great. All right, we're caught up. Um, I, think, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Yeah, and, and it's like, I will, like, fully admit, it's one of, basically, the books that made me realize, even though characters, for me, is, like, the most important thing, it's not enough if that's all you got. So, for The Stand, I would give it, like, a good score for characters, and then, a, basically, a bad score for everything else, um, I mean, for I, my I think, enjoyment. I think Harold is one of my favorite antagonists of all time. Yeah, he's great, um, and I really love Nick who's my favorite yeah, um, protagonist. Great. And every time we got to like the Nick chapters, I was like, yeah, Nick, I love Nick. Um, hey, I see Codex Alera hype in the chat. Oh Good yeah. Stuff. I, I, um, have, I have so many things in chat that I have to put on screen and then like acknowledge, but I, I like where this is going uh, because you kind of are hitting on something that I really like about Dark Tower. So you have to remember the stand is, is early King. Yeah. Right? He has grown so much as an author and the Dark Tower is a really good example of that. Uh, I actually love the gunslinger. Like the more I sit on the gunslinger after reading it a second time, I actually like, I, I think I love it. <laughs> uh, but I've noticed a huge wolves of Kala was not my favorite of the dark tower. Mine right now is book four wizard in glass, but the writing upgrade here in, in the fifth book, it is really cool to see. 17 year old king all the way through into the 2000s and it's really cool i will fully admit the idea of going into my first king book into a 470,000 word novel was a terrible idea 
Um, I'm also probably going to make Alan mad at me because I was not a fan of Trash Can Man that much. Like, he was fine, but... You're out of your mind. Trash Can yeah. Man is yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's good. I don't know. I just, I didn't love him as much as it seems like everyone else does. Um, like, you know, it's not like I dislike Trash Can Man. I'm just mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, he's fine. Um, so hopefully Alan doesn't bully me. Um, but hey, Alan, there's a lot of characters that people bully Alan for not liking. So I'm sure he'll be hey, empathetic. We, we all we all have our favorites, right? So yeah. Um, so he said Wizard of Glass is the best one so far in Dark Tower. I think I would agree. I have to think about it more. I'm going to do a tier video when I finish the Dark Tower or probably not tier, just ranking them. Um, Elena hated Indianapolis only loved the first part about the virus. I, I do think I think this is a problem with like post apocalyptic works is sometimes the thing that sets up the event is more interesting than what follows. I didn't feel that way for the stand. But I can understand why people can feel that way, because I there's a lot of post-apocalyptic movies that kind of glance over the big event. And then it's like them, like, for instance, uh, what was that one? 2012 or 2022? I, I can't remember. It was some shitty movie about the Mayan calendar being correct. I love like the first half hour of that movie or like Greenland with uh, it was it like 2012. Yeah, that was because yeah. it's like the Mayan calendar said the world was going to end in 2012 because yeah. the Mayans were dyslexic and. 2021 to 20, yeah. anyways whatever <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you know it happens and then it's just like them like trying to survive but like the events have stopped you know what i mean i, I don't i actually kind of prefer to see more and more of the events like you could do an hour and a half of just different povs of people's lives being ruined and i would that's awful of me but it would be really entertaining <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of like the first bit of the stand the thing that kind of makes it interesting is the situation and how it develops yeah. um i think the last two third it relies a lot more on you liking the characters so i think for people i i don't think the writers of 2012 have been accused of being amazing writers of characters I know it was a movie, but like obviously people wrote the script. Uh, so I feel like when you have the post-apocalyptic things, you can get away with not being great at character for um, the first part. But then mm -hmm. it gets a lot harder when the characters kind of interacting and trying to not die is what it is. Also, I saw two people share some Codex Alera love. Oh, we're going to um, get we're going to get and this Jim pleases Butcher. me greatly. We're going to um, get the Sir Jim Butcher here in a minute. Um for sure, because uh, I mean, to me, you're the Dresden ambassador. Um, I mean, there's a lot of Dresden ambassadors. I think I'm almost I, I do like Dresden a little bit more than Alara, but I think compared to how much other people talk about Alara, I'm almost more of the Alara ambassador. Um, I actually, I, I, I agree because you have almost got me to not read Dresden and to read Codex Alara, which I think is hilarious. Acceptable. Um, Leslie has got to run. Thanks for stopping by. Appreciate Bye, having Leslie. fun at D&D. Um, I just want to point out that Alan and Leslie both enjoyed the gunslinger, which makes me feel a little better about that unpopular opinion. I've like morphed on that opinion over time because uh, there's a lot of people who uh, <laughs> who do not agree with that. But there was a Dresden question, and I think this is going to be our launching point uh, for you uh, going to bat for Jim. But not going to bat because I'm not against him. But Head Cannon says Dresden will be 17 books so there's no only a few left i haven't read, read any i think leslie already said there's 22 no there's books. currently so there's dresden will have 22 case books and then a big apocalyptic trilogy so 25 books total that basically um there's a jim has a lot of funny stories about how his books came to be because he can't just come up with ideas in a normal way so um he was in a writing class he kind of went to school and he had a writing instructor there's not going to be any spoilers for anything alan um Oh, Ellen's playing Mass Effect. I'm getting off topic. We'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I'm now telling the Jim story. So anyways, he was in a writing class and he was not a particularly good student. He really thought he was hot shit and his writing instructor didn't know what she was talking about because he had a, you know, bachelor's with an emphasis on creative writing or whatever. Um, so he's like, you know what? I'm going to prove my writing instructor wrong. I'm going to do everything she tells me to do um and she's gonna see like how shit the result is and so he went as a university student and he wrote the first two chapters for stormfront the first novel in the dresden files um so he gets back and his teacher's like this is actually like this is good enough to sell i don't know if you'll sell it now but you'll be able to sell it like eventually this is good um go write go outline the rest of it and she meant go outline the rest of book one and he outlined the rest of the entire series 
Um, and he outlined a, at the time it was a 20 book series, 20 case books um, with a big apocalyptic trilogy at the end. And then he got back and she was just like, he's never going to publish this thing. But she didn't want to like shit on him when he was finally doing what she said. So she's like, yeah, whatever. And went along with it. And so it's going to be, and then two books got added along the way. Um, for reasons, um, the, the last two, one book got split into two. And then basically Jim realized after the last book, he has to have, there's so many consequences happened. He can't go straight into the next book he planned. So, how many books are there now? 17. Jesus. They're short though. Eh, that's a lot of books, brother. <laughs> yeah. It's like 2 million words. Um, that's a lot of words. Um, I will say there's some of the fastest reads that I read, like even people who read slow, um, read Dresden fast. You just can't read it slow. Um, yeah. they're, uh, they're very fast reads. Like even it's kind of almost every really long series has some books that are kind of considered not as good. Um, like, you know, wheel of time has the slog, uh, yeah. realm of the elderlings has rain wilds yeah. Dresden. You get rid of those right off the bat. It's one and two, the <laughs> two mean, worst ones. I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. Yeah, I'm trying to, for, anyways, I will. So it's totally, it's, um, but it's also, it's kind of like the reason the first two aren't as good is because he wrote them in universe. He just wasn't a professional author at the time. Yeah. Um, so it's not like one and two are bad and then three is good. And then it stays at that level throughout. Basically, if you split Dresden into a bunch of trilogies in your mind, mm -hmm. every trilogy is better than the last one. And I mean, even the first trilogy, like if I just read the first trilogy and was like, this is my series review, I'd be like, this was a really fun series. Um, I wouldn't read them all like back to back, but it'd kind of be like, you know, I just read a 400,000 word epic fantasy. I want something fun um, just to kind of, you know, just to be fun and kind of be a palate cleanser. And then they just kind of slowly get better in i have heard of, like that. every aspect i heard like you just uh, one day you wake up and you're in the middle of like one of the you, you know your favorite series of all time that's yeah it, it's it, it's literally it's hard to express how much improved because people ask like oh what aspect improves and it's like well the prose plotting world building character dialogue and action <laughs> and humor improve so, I, I think uh stewart carver has a pretty conf i i have never even read dresden and i know this is a hot take that is that stormfront is better than changes incredibly spicy Matt, take. don't go too hard on him all right he's part of the fantasy network community i, I get <laughs> well i'm so glad you enjoyed stormfront <laughs> that much i guess I <laughs> Well, you know what? Uh, it's interesting. I did not know that story, but the story I do kind of have a semi grasp on uh, is the fact that, and it sounds like this is a common theme with Jim Butcher. He was challenged to make Codex of Alera as well in a forum post, right? It was, it was yeah, it was a bet. Yeah, um, can you explain that for the people listening who might not have? Yeah, heard it? so sure. Um, he was having an argument with someone, um, and the person he was arguing, they were both aspiring writers in their twenties. Um, and the person he was arguing with was saying that the key to writing like a best-selling book is coming up with like the best idea possible. Um, and Jim was kind of saying, no, you can take any idea. If you write it well enough, it'll be really good. Um, and so basically the guy he was arguing with was like, you know, what about Jurassic Park? Like who can, like that idea is so good. Like that has to be successful. Right. Um, and Jim was kind of like, look how many successful renditions there are of Romeo and Juliet, which is like not an original idea at all. Um, and the guy he was arguing with was like, all right, how about you put your money where your mouth is? I will give you an idea and you have to go write a book about it, no matter what I give you. <laughs> um, and he was like, how about you give me two ideas and the thing I write about will have both. And the person he was talking to then did the biggest oof ever because his shit ideas were like, not that shit. He gave Lost Roman Legions as his first one. Lost Roman Legions are cool, but whatever. <laughs> um, he was sick of Lost Roman Legions, and then he also didn't like Pokemon. Um, and obviously, they're not literally Pokemon, but it's kind of Jim went and did a bunch of research on like where the origins of Pokemon were and kind of then took influence from that. Um, 
and yeah, that's kind of, that's, it's not the premise for like the plot, but the premise for the world is the lost Roman Legion didn't actually get killed by the Scots in, uh, in Roman history. It went out and, you know, ended up in a different world and this world every object has like a nature spirit that represents it and yes alan lost roman all roman legions are cool alan gets it because alan correctly loves the romans um yeah (laughs) well i think that oh sorry alan i got the history wrong it didn't get killed by all right alan can you tell us what happened to the lost roman legion oh no (laughs) we're gonna get a full (laughs) history paper i should just bring him in here i mean god damn (laughs) I did. It didn't get killed by the Scots. I am a direct descendant. The, what massive spoiler did I just spoil? Like history, Andrew. I, I, I think, think he I just... definitely won that bet. I like. Oh that. yeah, I think. Oh no, the thing is, he um he actually says he lost the bet because then he goes up to the guy and he's like, "Wow, that was actually a really good idea." And the guy's like, "Wait, so you're saying it's the idea?" And he's like, "Yeah, whatever. You can have the bet. I'm gonna go publish <laughs> these six novels." <laughs> um, yeah i'm gonna wait for my uh my checks yeah my royalty check came in enjoy your victory so, so i i have to ask you i mean first off i think that that story alone makes me want to read codex of alara, of alara. It's not, uh, there's no of it's just codex, oh, codex alara. alara all right well whatever uh yeah stop spoiling rome i'm still on julius caesar <laughs> <laughs> oh you'll be shocked by the ending of that one it's Yikes. a shocking plot twist george yeah. r martin just stole from it yeah um um, so what is it about Jim Butcher that you think makes Dresden Codex Alaire, all this stuff so good? Like, you know, I, I can point to things about the authors that I recommend people to read a lot of the times. What is it about Jim Butcher's writing that makes you lo- like? Yeah. So, so there's, there's a few general things that I think he's just very good at. And then there's a few very specific things. So the general things, and I think his biggest strength in general is, um, the relationships and development of side characters. And one reason is he was, before I read more Hob, in contention for my favorite dialogue writer. Oh, um, wow. Now it's now it's Hob on her own. But before, after reading Farseer, all of Jim Butcher's stuff and Gentleman <laughs> Bastards, I had it as a three-way tie. I wasn't sure between, between Scott Lynch, Jim Butcher, and Robin Hobb. You wouldn't put Abercrombie in that list. I, he'd be close behind. I think there's something in dialogue that Jim is very good at that I value a lot. Um, and it's Joe Abercrombie is very, very good at when people talk, they express who they are. What I think Butcher and Hobb are better at is also expressing how they view the person they're talking to. So it's the idea that like, you know, if you talk to me or talk to someone else or talk to, you know, someone, you know, at work or an acquaintance, you're not going to talk exactly the same to all the people. Mm -hmm. And I think Hobb is the best at that. And conveying how, like, having people talk differently to everyone. But if Hobb is one at that, I've got Jim Butcher at two. Um, wow. And I think that's his biggest strength. That's the thing he's, um, his biggest strength. He's also just very good at, like, pacing. There's mm-hmm. very, very, and very, very rarely books that kind of stall out in the middle. Um, while also, uh, they don't tend to feel rushed to me. Um Harry Dresden himself, who's the protagonist of the Dresden Files, is just one of my favorite characters ever in the genre in just how well you know him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I still probably, I feel like as a person, I know him better than basically anyone I've read. Um, And yes, I just, Andrew just mentioned Aeronauts Winless. It's great too. We're moving on. I was actually going to ask, what is that about? Uh, So that is basically, it's a, it's kind of, post-apocalyptic but not like you see the apocalypse happen it's way post-apocalyptic and the surface is completely uninhabitable and everyone lives in these big spires um and it's kind of steampunk in that it has a combination of like swords and also like plasma laser gun type things uh Mm -hmm. you got flying sailboats um i think it's his best first book but first books are not one of Jim's weaknesses as a writer is his first books, in my opinion. Um, and then you that gets made up later in that the man just straight up doesn't believe in middle book syndrome. Like if you have to trust <laughs> someone to write book four of a six book series, he's like my number one power ranking. I guess uh, A Storm of Swords is technically a middle book, Ooh. but so is A Feast for Crows. 
All right, if we're saying book four of a six book series, Jim Butcher is my like my number one power it, ranking for middle. I, book I'll series. tell you what, middle book syndrome is getting less and less popular with me. Like seeing it as I just read better authors. To That's be true. honest, uh, like like I don't think Hob has that issue at all. She writes some of the best book twos and trilogies I've ever read. The funny thing is, for Hob, with the exception of Royal Assassin, and well, for the for Live Ship and Tawny Man. The middle book is my least favorite for both, but her baseline is just so absurdly out of this world. Yeah, there's still like there's still like nine out of ten books. Yeah. But I mean, even like if we take comparatively, like for Tawny Man, Golden Fool is pretty easily my least favorite Tawny Man book. Yeah, it's still really it's just really it's good. it's just her base level is so insanely high. Well, well, also when we talk about middle book syndrome, we're not saying that it's that it's the worst. We're saying that there's there's like literal pitfalls that come with yeah, that and, and I I think all of her book twos avoid it. I thought Golden Fool had a ton. I actually thought Golden Fool and the Mad Ship. I was kind of like, all right, I can see this is a middle book. It's just they're both so damn good that I didn't care. See, I thought Golden Fool had a pretty decisive ending. Um, where again, I, it's the same feeling I had in Fool's Air. I'm like, I mean, I want to pick up, pick up the next book, but I have an ending here. Like, that I, exact, a good I mean, Hob is known for being very good at middle books. That's kind of yeah something she's known at. On the other hand, if you look at all of um, Realm of the Elderlings as its own series, then Rainwilds are the middle book syndrome. Listen, listen. And Dresden is, you know, 17 books right now. Normally, you expect for the 17 book series, like if you see a 17 book series, you expect... Well, it's going to be 25. You expect the early books to be like really strong when the ideas were fresh and there was novelty. Um, and then the novelty starts to wear off and he kind of starts running. The author starts running out of ideas and it kind of starts getting burnt out around like book, you know, 10 to 15. Meanwhile, yeah. Jim Butcher's like book 10 to 15 is one of the most insanely fantastic five book stretches I've ever read. Um, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. that that's all good stuff to hear. Um, especially the dialogue. I'm pretty big on dialogue. It's like one of the things that has always kept Joe Abercrombie in my top five favorite authors uh, because I, I love his dialogue. And I agree with you. I think that Hob writes phenomenal dialogue. I also think like the thing you were talking about, how they talk to differently to different people. Uh, George does that oh, yeah. really well. Very well. Um, I, I got to pick a fight with Alan to say Feast for Crows is trash. I couldn't disagree more. On my first read through, I, I didn't like Feast for Crows. I actually gave it like three stars. Then on like, I don't know, the millionth reread, I was like, oh, I actually really like this. Uh, and then mainly it's because of Jamie and Brienne. Uh, yeah, I really like Jamie and Feast for Crows, but it's it's pretty easily my least favorite A Song of Ice and Fire book. I wouldn't call it trash. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't go as far as Alan. Pretty uh, but, egregious. But uh, I would say I like the other four Song of Ice and Fire books significantly more yeah it's it's funny he's saying uh you're the only person i uh who likes that book no i know that's not true i know a handful of people i'm, I'm a lot more it's the only really the fandom that i would say i'm in uh and there's a lot of people that really like feast for chris and a lot of people like uh the boiled leather or feast for dragons read through which is uh, what i'm gonna do on this next one um Oh my I'm not even putting it on the screen. <laughs> I'm not even if I if I had to uh, defend uh, Song of Ice and Fire to everyone who dunks on it on a daily basis, I'd never read or get anything else done. <laughs> yeah, I think a feast for feast for crows is kind of if you look at fantasy fans who have read A Song of Ice and Fire and have it kind of like you know they like the series but don't love it, like me for example, or I guess Alan. I don't know how much he likes A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, Feast for Crows is almost universally last, but among people who have A Song of Ice and Fire as their favorite series ever, I see people put it pretty high sometimes. Um, like it's probably still in aggregate people's least favorite, but um, like the A Song of Ice and Fire mega fans, like say Jimmy Nuts, um, tend to really love Feast for Crows, and yeah. Dance of Dragons is definitely not trash. Also, uh, Andrew Krause is right. You should all add Dresden Files to your TBRs. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with that. And uh, Andrew's Wizardly Reads just finished up Live yeah. Ship, which is pretty awesome. And I'm seeing people talk about the middle book syndrome where we're talking about, talking about Red Rising. I've also heard that. I'm going to be starting Red Rising probably August. Don't quote me on that. I might have to sneak a book in or two before that. But um, my, my original plan was to read um, Red Rising like at the same time as Fitz and the Fool, so alternate. But yeah. I think I'm just going to binge Fitz and the Fool all three back-to-back. -back. Um, 
because I want to. Yeah, I mean, I I actually thought about adding Red Rising into my chaos of Dark Tower and Realm of the Elderlings, but Red Rising is a series that I've been really excited about, and I want to give it its due. You know what I mean? So, like, once I finish up one of them, I'll definitely jump in. I mean, Pat Smith coming in feeds for crows way too much flack. I can put ahead of a, a Clash of Kings and a Dance with Dragon. That's interesting. I, I and this is another thing. I actually just saw other people today talking about how bad Dance with Dragons is, and uh, I you know I, I don't agree, but I'm biased, so. Uh, that's fine. I, I, mean, I really like dance. Um, dance is my second least favorite song of ice and fire book, but it's a lot closer to the book above it than it is to my least favorite, a song of ice and fire book. Um, I'm somewhat weird in that a clash of Kings is my second favorite. And obviously a storm of swords is the best song of ice and fire book as is universally agreed on by 98% of people. Yeah. Storm of swords is my favorite book of all time. Yeah. Definitely. Um, it's, Kind of one of those books where, as I said before, stylistically, I just don't get along with George's writing style. But it's it's like it's as good of an execution of what it's trying to be that I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Carver says that Dance Dragons is his second favorite. I, I, I go back and forth. Honestly, Game of Thrones is a really good book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think... I see people have it second or I'm going to make fun of myself real quick. So I reviewed a game of Thrones on my channel and I was like trying to be like Mr. Critical. This is like my first action. It's not my first video, my first review. And I was like, uh, game of Thrones, eh, like a four out of five. <laughs> and then now like, I'm looking back, I'm like, I'm an idiot. It's easily a five out of five. Like, what was I doing? You know, but I didn't want to set the, I didn't want to be the guy that comes on and does a five star review. Right. When he started, I, I thought about it way too much. Uh, okay, so Andrews Wizardly Reads is asking who wins a fight between Logan Nine Fingers or Dresden. Like Nine Fingers is great, Dresden is fucking magic. Uh, like, well, I I can't I can't weigh in, but no. Uh, I, so, I, like f fighting people who are much stronger and faster than him is like a Tuesday for Dresden. That's that, that's the hardest fight for Logan's. That I'm quoting a bad movie now. Um, for for Logan, his fight against Harry Dresden was the most important day of his life. But for Dresden, it was Tuesday. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty great line. I won't lie. Yeah. Baez and Dresden, Baez's abilities are not well fleshed out enough to Baez would buy either out. Way. Baez would just buy out whatever house. Oh, yeah. Up. Baez actually would bankrupt Dresden. You're right. Baez yeah. would win indirectly. That's he, what would happen. He, he'd be outy. Embrace the five star trumpetude. Yeah, you know what? Actually, this is a this is a really good thing. So uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but Jake is very meticulous with his rating system. That's true. And Jimmy Nuts, your 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 neighborhood nerd over here, not quite. Um, so I would love to know what goes in to your rating system. So the funny thing is, how I get the number is not meticulous at all. It's um, I have. <laughs> But the thing that is meticulous is how consistent I am day to day. And that I don't tend to change my opinions that much on books after I read them. Um, there are rare books that a month later, I'm like, okay, I actually like this way more now. For example, mm -hmm. Fool's Errand, I bumped up. Didn't have much room to get bumped up, but I bumped it up anyways. Um, and uh, there were some Lightbringer books that have been consistently been moving down. But basically how I get the number is I have uh, a Google Doc that has my favorite books for like every book I've given four stars or higher. And I'm like, how much do I like this book? It started with, I basically, it like the number is just purely a reflection of how much I like the book. It's not like, you know, characters is weighted as this much, uh, plot is weighted as this much, like, you know, yeah, how how long are the sentences or whatever? No, I don't. I don't do any of that. I'm like, how much do I like it? And as Andrew says, I go with my gut as well, but my yeah. gut is very precise. Um, and so my gut doesn't decide. That's around a three stars. My gut decides Would that's a six point seven out of ten. <laughs> um, um, sorry. So um, yeah, <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah, I guess if I was an author, that would be the word that people make fun of. You know, you know, there's some words that people uh. Are like like uh, Erickson. People say like, oh, he uses ochre all the time. Um, George R. R. Martin says words are wind constantly. I'd get made fun of for using meticulous. I I, uh, I say um a lot. Um, which yeah, is me great, too. Right. Uh, Catherine asks, is it a relative tier ranking? Which is what I'm kind of interested in. Um, is it a relative tier ranking? As in, like, can you compare a rating of two books? Yes. Okay. Yeah, across series. So yeah, See, if, if 
if if you look at two books from completely different series, if one has a higher ranking, I like it more. Yeah, well, see, it's just funny because I am not like that at all. I like there's books. So basically, if you go on my Goodreads, which you should never do, uh, but if you do and you look at all my right yeah, you look at all my five stars, you're gonna be like, these books are both not five stars, and it's, it has literally nothing to do. Like I stop trying to compare books in some ways. Some ways I can, but like A Storm of Swords is a five star book. I've never read a book that's ever gripped me like it ever. Am I never supposed to give another five stars? I know a lot of people say, yeah, you just don't give another five stars. That's eh. that's eh. why I started giving the decimal ratings because I was like, all right, I obviously I love Wave Kings. It's one of my favorite books ever, and I love Words of Radiance. I'm giving both of them five stars. Um, if I look at a book that like barely got five stars on my um list uh the blade itself uh which was like a 9.1 out of 10 um i really like it but i'm like do i want to give it the same score probably not so i'm like all right i'll be more specific that way i don't have to only give like five books i'll tell you what i actually like that is the best defense for a decimal in a rating i've ever heard like you might have just convinced me a little bit I, there's a reason I'm uh, slowly converting people, you know? Yeah, I think it's, but I've seen, uh, I've seen things break down. It's like, well, it's more of a 9.7 rather than a 9.5. And that's where like, you just lose me. Cause I'm like, if I have to think about this, you know, I look at numbers all day. I'm like, eh, yeah. yeah, I basically, I give my number at the end of the review. I have English descriptions for all the whole numbers to kind of help me figure it out. So mm. like basically a 9.5 out of 10, you can translate to among my favorite books of all time. Yeah, that's I what mean, 9.5 out of 10 means. I think um, that's fair. Nine out of 10 means I absolutely loved it. I don't, I have no major cons. I might have like a tri- some trivial things I was not a fan of. <laughs> Alan says Jake's rating system is a military boot camp. <laughs> Me and Jimmy's is like an all inclusive trip to Sandals, Jamaica. <laughs> Dude, that is the best wow. way to describe my rating system. <laughs> Like if a book one, if a book makes me get emotional, whether that be like overjoyed or cry or whatever, immediate five stars almost because anytime that you can, I be I feel like I'm get, becoming hardened as an old man. You know, I'm becoming very callous, and whenever I feel uh, any emotion get starting to stir with me, and it sits with me after I close the book. I'm like, they did something correct here. Whether or not I'm going to be able to identify why that happened, that's up to me. But like, for instance, sort of Kaigen, sort of Kaigen absolutely devastated me. And same. I was like, this is one of the best books I've ever read. Royal Assassin, same thing. Uh, Joe Abercrombie, every single book I read of his, I end up coming away with it so happy after. Like, I'm laughing. I'm having a great time. It literally helps me kind of escape. And I'm an escapist reader. So when a book's able to do that for me and kind of give me some emotion, it immediately shoots like way up on the list. Yeah, that's like that's where the really high ratings come from. The reviews are basically me trying to figure out why it did that. Like when I say, you know, when I give Ship of Magic a 10 out of 10, it's not a 10 out of 10 because of her like fantastic characterization. It's a 10 out of 10 because I felt all the emotions the character felt the fantastic characterization is one step out. It's w- the fantastic characterization is why I felt all the emotions the character felt. Um, yeah. Well, I think also books can be five stars for different reasons. Yeah, for sure. You know like, what I mean? There's um, there's like a spreadsheet some people use that it, it also ends up with a decimal result, but not how I do it. And it's like where you rank each individual aspect out of 10 and then it plugs out a score and I am not a fan of doing that because not only is it just because the way it weights it is really whack where it's like, you know, characters is worth as much as all the other categories, but also it's not like those factors are equally important for every book. Yeah. Um, like when I read Robin Hobb, the prose is a pretty large aspect of my enjoyment. So if I had prose as a not important category, it would do Hobb a disservice but there's also lots of books with just have pretty average prose that I love almost as much, but that's just because the prose isn't as important to my enjoyment. Yeah. Like for example, I think Toll the Hounds, which Alan's a huge fan of Toll the Hounds, big Toll the Hounds fan, which I'm sure he's not going to disagree with me um, in chat. Toll <laughs> the Hounds is probably one where I would have the, the themes it tackles higher than I normally do. Um, and it's actually like, in terms of characters, it's not my favorite 
Malazan book. And that's kind of weird for it then to be my favorite Malazan book in total. Yeah, but it's weird. because that's a book where theme is more important. So I, I'm not a fan of the like plug in individual things and get a number that way. I just purely rate based on enjoyment. I just do it more in a more precise fashion. Yeah, or more it, meticulous fashion. Yeah, and also books can catch you off guard, right? Like you go in saying, I care about characters and I care about prose, right? And then a plot blows you your your socks off, right? And then you go, well, damn, this is a five-star book and it didn't even have the things that I consider to have to be weighed heavy. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. so subjective. Um, you know, when people tell me that Mistborn is their favorite series of all time, I don't like doubt that or anything, but I know that they're not, they're not some like they did not go into it expecting the most amazing prose of all time, which is totally fine. Yeah, I think John Gwynn has very serviceable, pro, serv, serviceable prose, but there's probably a lot of people read John Gwynn and say, oh, this is very tropey. Uh, you know, it's, this isn't uh, the highest prose of all time. Eh. But for me, it's like John Gwynn told a story that just ended up blowing me away and Wrath won my book of the year last year. You know what I mean? So uh, things can catch you off guard. Uh, but I yeah, think it's interesting sure. to talk about these type of things and like how how you come to, especially whenever you put so much stock into rating. You know what I mean? Like I think it's cool to to see exactly what uh, people think about whenever they're giving out those ratings. Did I miss the Dresden? We did talk about Dresden, but I'm sure we're going to double back. I'm sure we're going to uh, try. I relate things to Dresden a lot, so I'll probably go back. Also, hi Alex. Um, and funnily enough, of the books who caught me off guard, responding as well to what Alan said here, I wasn't really expecting to like Toll the Hounds that much. Um, told the hounds from what I've been told. I was kind of, I went in with wary expectations, but mm -hmm. it's still one of those books that I'm not, you know how I say my reviews are me in hindsight, trying to figure out why I like a book. Yeah. I'm not sure why I like told the hounds as much as I did. Sometimes but you like, don't have to know, but Holy crap. I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> um, which is also what told the hounds is one of those books that I totally get why some people have it as like one of their least favorite Malazan books. Okay, I say people. I mean Alan. He's he's the one person, but um, because I don't even know why I love it, but I do. So <laughs> I guess that's just how it is sometimes. Alex wants to know who is this guy? Uh, Jake. This is Jake Bishop. He's a booktuber. He is a sellout. Um, that's true. Yeah. Which selling out on booktube? I don't know what that really means. I think I don't know how I managed it, uh, considering I have like three hundred and something subscribers. And I think selling out on booktube is like switching you know, to uh, audible sponsorship. I don't know. Something like that. It, would that be considered selling? Maybe you write a novel or novella or something. I don't mean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Jake, <laughs> all the hounds is way worse than you people say it is. You're all indoctrinated by the Reapers. I don't know what any of this means. Um, I do want to address this. I'm very hesitant about trying to Abercrombie. I've heard that his books lack a bit of emotional weight and depth, which isn't necessarily what everyone looks for. I disagree because emotional, when we're talking about emotional weight, I mean, that is the encompassing wheel of all emotions. And Joe Abercrombie ca captures a lot of things very well. I think grief's pretty well. I mean, it's not like Robin Hobb levels of, you know, inspected, but he will make you, if he clicks with your humor, he's going to make you laugh. Yeah, so, and and also, like, what has emotional weight and depth is going to vary book to book. So I know a ton of people in First Law chats who um, get, like, hit super emotionally from the First Law. I, I didn't quite get hit, like, emotionally as much. I think the reason I love Abercrombie books is how, like, interesting they are. Um, I think he writes the most interesting characters in the genre, where it's, like, you know just being in their head is so fascinating and you're like trying to figure out what's going on with them. Um, I don't, I don't like cry when Joe Abercrombie characters die. Um, I did, but I'm sure there, but I know a lot of people who do. Yeah. So that's, um, that's, I think the only way to know whether it'll have emotional depth for you is to read it and find out. And it's, uh, it's definitely worth reading because Abercrombie is fantastic. Yeah, and also his new trilogy, I think, uh, in every single aspect of what it takes to be a writer, he did a better job with, and that's thematically, prose, characters, plot, and emotional weight. His new, uh, his new trilogy is phenomenal. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, the Trouble with Peace was really close to winning my book of the year last year. Not that that means a goddamn thing, but just wanted to put that out there. Alex says, I meant the guy wearing the glasses. I, oh, I actually think um, that what you just said is going to be on the cover of Wisdom of Crowds. It's going to be um I almost wish. won my book of the 
uh, like your award, Jimmy Nuts. That's that's the cover quote. I, I would like to think that that could happen one day, but it won't. <laughs> uh, next is Zen, and uh, I'm going to kick this over to you, Jake, so you can uh, react to this. Dresden Files kind of caught me off guard. I was expecting something much darker. I still love it, but the covers of most urban fantasy make it seem like these seedy nighttime underbellies. That's kind of what I get from those covers, too. Yeah, I mean, the covers aren't very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, oh, I will say the cover artist has improved a lot. I don't know if my headset can reach my Dresden books, but if you compare like the last couple Dresden covers to the first ones, yeah, the Stormfront covers are pretty ridiculous. Um, like, yeah, you're right, actually. Now I think about it, those covers make you think that Dresden is going to be like this really serious, grim character, when in reality, he's like a very sarcastic character who... yeah really needs to learn to keep his mouth shut but yeah. never will and that's fine that's cool that's cool i mean that is good to know because i definitely thought it was gonna be like a crime underbelly now i have also heard enough context where i know that dresden's a smart ass and oh yeah know, always cracking jokes so that that kind of helps expectations matter a lot this is a real conversation from the dresden files someone asked dresden are you always this much of a smart ass he replies no sometimes i'm asleep <laughs> That's a, that's a very cheeky line. I like it. Yeah. Uh, Stewart says problem with character driven books is if you don't click, then there's nothing else for me. That's what happened first. Yeah, that absolutely can happen. Absolutely. Uh, that happened with me and Mistborn, to be honest. Uh, the one character I really like wasn't around after a certain point, And I was like, I'm kind of out on it. Uh, and I could see first law. If, if you aren't getting invested in those characters. Yeah, I could see it. I could. Yeah, really it's like it. usually I need a book to be good in terms of character and plot, but sometimes a book can be, you have to be like, sometimes a book can be so exceptional at one that I'm kind of okay with the other. Mm -hmm. uh, like the plot of Fool's Assassin, it, it's, you can expect, this is very much a slice of life book primarily, but the character work is so outrageously good mm -hmm. that it's outrageously good. Um, yeah. It's probably harder to do that with an amazing plot and mediocre characters. I think the closest I'd actually come, like, I like the characters in Mistborn, but if you're going to tell me, even though I love Mistborn, like, do you think Mistborn has, like, some of the best characters in the genre? I'm obviously not going to say it does, but it's, in terms of the plot, I think it's one of, it might be my pick for, like, my favorite plotting of anything I've read. So it kind of makes up for, like, if you look at my top 10 character list, I think I would prefer the characterization in the other nine all over Mistborn. And I mean, Mistborn is lower on that top 10 is probably like pretty close to 10. Um, but I love the plot for Miss yeah. so much, but you yeah. have to be so good at one of those to make up for lacking in the other. Yeah. I mean, I also don't subscribe to the first law has no plot theory. I don't, I, I don't, I just don't. Um, but I think you can get away with not having super great characters depending on your book's length and the approach you take to the story. If that makes sense. Uh, it works a lot in movies. Yeah. Uh, movies can kind of get away with things books can't though yeah as long as you know I, I understand who the character is in a movie if the idea is really really good yeah it works out like for instance uh i just watched greenland i keep bringing it up but it was such a terrible movie i hated it uh and part of the reason is the characters i mean the the plot to me was nonsensical but also the characters were just so bad you know but it makes sense for books to need better characters because you spend a lot more time with them yeah, I, and I mean, also books, I think it's amazing how much non-books can get away with. Almost every other medium can have a score and music playing in the background. And I think it's hard to exaggerate how much easier that makes it to kind of grab you. Yeah. Um, and books can't do that. Yeah. Um, and movies, I mean, you can just have like amazing visuals and an amazing score. And like, you know, the, the scenes in Lord of the Rings where they're like panning over New Zealand with the score are good. Like you don't get to do that for yeah. books. Yeah. I mean, there is some descriptive writing and sometimes it's really good, but that's usually like to set the scene. It's not like you're going to be like, oh, this book was great because the way they describe the trees. Well, was fantastic. The, I mean, oh. that's some people. It's an thing. aspect of it, but that it's like some people's thing. I rarely be like it's rarely like the primary motivation to loving a book over like the story or the characters or the themes. I will say there's something about Tolkien's descriptions that I feel at home with every time I go back and reread it. Um, I, I, this is actually a, a pretty good point uh, to bring this up. 
Uh, so I, I've said this before. Everyone probably knows I'm not a very visual reader. It's very rare. Actually, well, one of the only authors and get me to imagine stuff. Stephen King, for some reason, uh, probably because it's more set in our world. But if you were not a visually driven reader, there's sometimes a series, even if that's not its main selling point, can miss with you. And I think a lot of the time Robert Jordan's writing misses with me because I'm not visualizing anything when he's taking two paragraphs to describe stuff. And it's yeah. It drags for me. You know what it's I mean? It's funny because I'm like um I'm like that for George R. R. Martin. Yeah. Like for his descriptions, I can't picture it at all. Um compared to Robert Jordan's per, uh descriptions. It's like a movie in my head. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily say I, I visualize anything with but it's not them though, is what I'm getting at. It's me as a reader. Yeah, it just depends what works with your brain. Yeah. Um I think also, by the way, Nexus mentioned Dresden earlier. We probably are going to get back to Dresden because I said the general things I think Jim butchered again really well, but there's also some really hyper specific things that we got. We got time. We have, so we'll probably get back to that. Um, who would you say is like he's asking like the more well rounded authors? Who do you think is like the most well rounded author in terms of having like or the well rounded series in terms of if you just thought of like all the aspects of a book, everything is good. Maybe nothing is like the best you've ever read. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll just read out uh, what the question is. It says, the best type of books are all-rounders. Not easy to achieve, but what would you guys say? Hit that, not jack-of-all-trades, but yeah, generally I mean, firing on all most cylinders. Firing um, on all cylinders. Hard. Daniel Abraham. We brought him up earlier. Da I immediately think of Daniel Abraham because when I recommend people the dagger and the coin and I tell them, you know, there's it's like merchant fantasy in, in a way, like propaganda slash merchant. Fan people are like, what? And I'm like, trust me, it's really interesting and it's not boring at all. But like to sell that plot's really hard. Like I, if you ask me like, what's Daniel Abraham do the best? I would be like, he does kind of everything the best. Um, and that's how I felt about the expanse when I, uh, you know, I've, I've only read book one. I've, I'm all caught up on the show, but when I read book one, I was just like, ah, this is just really good. Like there's really nothing I can, you know, bitch about. And that's what I said in my, in my review is I can't imagine a book one going really much better than this. Yeah, and I know you're going to totally disagree with my answer for the person that you like every aspect of, but here it comes. It's it's Stormlight. Um, there's I even get along with Sanderson's prose. I know a lot of people criticize mm -hmm. Sanderson's prose. Um, I find it – Sanderson's prose has a – like I can – I never get tired reading it, and I can picture everything, and the emotional punches land. What more do I want? Um, I love the characters. The world is obviously insane. Um big fan of the plotting. I go back and forth. I think uh, Stormlight plotting, responding to what Headcanon says, is kind of more... No, oh, by the way, Alan, Jimmy does like Stormlight, just not as much as me. Um, I, I love Stormlight. I, I think, would you argue that we like Stormlight as much as... I know you love Stormlight. I mean, like, Stormlight re contends for my favorite series ever. I don't think it contends no. for your no. favorite series ever. It, it could be... It, it, as a series, it could be maybe top five. Yeah. Um... But yeah, I, I have feelings. Yeah. I have feelings. Anyway, my other answer for all rounder series and this one, it doesn't quite hit the highs that Stormlight does where it doesn't have anything that I'd be like, this is the best it's done in the genre, but it is Codex Lara. I feel is a very, very solid all around series that I don't really think has any true weaknesses. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's high praise. That's very high praise. Um, I think I think these kind of things are important too because like I, people will I will run around with my shirt off, my pants off, screaming to the end of the world that Robin Hobb is the greatest character writer ever to live. Uh, and it's kind of a shame whenever we have all arounders that do things very well, but like there's nothing. It's not nothing, but there's just so much to talk about, or or one thing doesn't overshadow the rest that you can't be like this is the best in genre. This right, and it, it's funny because those things do end up falling a lot to the side. Uh, so yeah, it, and it's like we should be better about that. Hob Hob is the same for me. Where the reason Hob is, I think she's probably my favorite author now. I think she's past Sanderson. In my head, for a while, I was just comparing all of Realm of the Elderlings to Stormlight, and like that's close for me. But then I remembered Sanderson has other books. Um, <laughs> but the reason Hob is my favorite author isn't because she's good at everything. It's because she has literally my favorite prose and is easily my favorite character writer, and is still like and has still like good for other stuff it's not like she's bad at things but she doesn't like stand out in every aspect but she just stands out so much in others i don't um, think hob does anything inherently bad yeah it's yeah. 
I don't think anyone would be like, oh, you know who my favorite, I think the best plotter in the genre is? Robin Hobb with the Farsi or Chile. Yeah. Like, it's not bad, yeah. but it's not like, I, I, I would be surprised if someone legitimately thought Hobb was like the best plotter in the genre. I'll, I'll, um, tell, you, I'll tell you who else is on this list. Like if we're talking about authors and like, I, I, I really don't want to always be this guy, but like, I think George actually does a really nice job too. Um, specifically thinking of fever dream, his vampire novel and, and, you know, uh song of ice and fire. Like a lot of people always talk about the characters, 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 but the plot's awesome. Like it's so yeah, good. Now, obviously he's very solid. If he doesn't finish that, uh, you know, before the end of times, whatever, like then we have to assess that. But as it stands, I always feel like he does a lot of things really well. Uh, and even in his other works, which which I've enjoyed immensely. Um, yeah, it's hard to sell 85 million books if you have glaring <laughs> weaknesses. Yeah, um, never know. Um, Brian Valeris has a question for me and you, Jake. He says, hey there, good and good evening. I just purchased Joe Abercrombie's First Law Trilogy. I haven't started yet. I just wanted to see what you guys thought about it. I love the First Law Trilogy. Joe Abercrombie is in my top five favorite authors of all time, and I think that he gets better with every single book, and that includes the trilogy. Um, I know... Jake, you probably have uh, maybe differing opinions. I don't know. I, I, I don't like it's kind of it's the reverse in that I don't quite like Abercrombie as much as you do, but I still really like Abercrombie. So it's the reverse of where we were talking about Stormlight. <laughs> um, I, I love the trilogy, though. Um, none of, um, it basically comes down to Grimdark isn't my favorite genre. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it he ever really has the potential to write a book that can, is, is among my favorite of all time. But he's written a lot of books that... I very much love and have very few flaws with um, in terms of character, like voice feeling both distinctive and like, I I'm hard pressed to think of someone who matches him. You just, you get so deep in his character's heads and they're so interesting to follow except for Pharaoh. Um, <laughs> whatever. I actually love uh, Pharaoh. <laughs> oh, okay. It's one of the most outstanding. Yeah. Never mind. I can't say anything spoilers, but I've got three questions for me on the side. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm working my way down here. Um, All right, but Brian, yeah, first of all, I really love it, and I think there's a lot of uh, benefits to reading the trilogy and then continuing on. Uh, Elena says to me, Lockwood and Co. series was absolutely perfect, so underrated, <laughs> and is written so maturely uh, despite being middle grade. It's scary and funny at the same time, which is hard to pull off. That's very cool. I had not heard of that. Um, oh, this is where you, would, yeah, because okay. I, I keep seeing the bottom of the chat. Yeah, so, so I, I do, I do love Stormlight. I, I did not love book four, and my book, my opinion on book three has shrunk a little bit since I've read it, but it's not like where I'm like, I went from good to bad. Okay. Uh, but book four, I will see if I like the morning reread. I was not the biggest fan of that. Um, I take it romance is excluded in these criteria. Actually, I, uh, I'm not a huge fan of romance usually because it's done poorly. Robin Hobb has amazing romance. Hobb's great at romance. Um, yeah. Actually, I think once again, Alara, when I said it has no true weaknesses, I was including romance on that. Um, the kind of main romance is one of my favorite in the genres. It's not something I put like when I'm reading a book, that's not something I, that's like one of my main priorities. Um, but uh, I think both those authors I was mentioning are pretty damn good at that. Yeah. Um, we got various opinions going on here. Brian was also wondering about the Game of Thrones series books. So I actually have a video on this on my channel. It's my very first video, and I still stand by it. And it basically says, is A Song of Ice Fire worth reading after the show? And in 2020, obviously it's 2021 now. But if you want to go check out that video on my channel, it's literally my first booktube upload. Go check it out. And uh, spoiler alert, the answer is yes. I think it's definitely worth reading, um, especially if you at all enjoyed the show or um, enjoy fantasy. I think it's really good. Uh, Fever Dream, yes, most underrated book compared to how popular the author is. Yes, Fever Dream is an awesome book. George is the goat. All right, finally, some people on my side here. Oh, my goodness. I was getting so much hate. Um, continue in my crusade to get uh, three Gentleman Bastards. That series is great plot scare. Yeah, Gentleman Bastards is probably going to happen next year. Yeah, it's it's great as well. I love Lies of Um As I said, I think in terms of like writing, you know, banter, between people mm -hmm. scott lynch is so good at writing banter i love it's banter. such as it's it's so good that's all this um, is that's what we're doing i now. know i say this to alex all the time because alex loves to complain about like the fantasy swears um oh me too scott lynch makes cursing an art form and he does not use fantasy swears it's actually oh. hilarious you obviously can't do this because it has spoilers but anyone who has read the lies of Locke lamora go to the quotes page of um of lies of Locke Lamora and look how much like swearing it. And anyways, he makes that an art form somehow. 
So uh, you should listen to Headcanon and read All right, that well, book. Um, well, here you go. Razika says, what's Jake's top three Malazan, Malazan books? God damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Toll the Hounds is my favorite. Um, second is Midnight Tides. And third is The Crippled God. Cool. Very cool. Um, let's see. I'm trying to make my way through chat. If you have a question here, we'll get to it. I promise. Uh, uh, notice clip says, Jake, what's your thoughts on rhythm of war? So I obviously I read rhythm of war really fast before what I knew what the general consensus was. And I was right on what the general consensus was. And I basically read it and I was like, I think the people who have Stormlight as like one of their top two or three series of all time are going to love this. And the people who like it, but have it like in the five to 15 are going to have it as their least favorite book. I'm part of the people that absolutely love Stormlight, and I absolutely love Rhythm of War. I love all four Stormlight books. It's my third favorite, but that's kind of like similar when I'm talking about if I say Tawny Man is my second favorite Hob trilogy. Pretty good trilogy still, um, which is why it's funny. I, I think I saw someone ask that's coming up. Oh, the next question is top three favorite trilogies. Can we get a can we get a transition here? I thought that went quite well. Yeah, um, except I'm going to ruin it real quick. <laughs> Well, oh, okay. uh, so I'll give my even though it wasn't direct towards me rhythm of war the thing about stormlight is and, and this is kind of what I offer everyone whenever I talk about it is the fact that what, what are we going to get when we get a new stormlight release right we're going to get a lot of hype of course but what we're also going to get is a lot more mysteries unraveled and probably a little little bit more mystery involved also we know the way that Brandon is following this formula of stormlight that we are going to have featured characters and if those featured characters don't happen to be ones that click with you, there's a chance that the novel could end up being a little flatter for you rather than someone else who really enjoys, for say, uh, Navani or Venley or whatever. Um, so I think that we have to approach Stormlight as readers and reviewers in that fashion and make sure that we uh, kind of uh, figure that in when we're talking about it. And I tried to do that as best as I could in my review. Uh, and it just happened to be uh, a couple features that I, I didn't necessarily care for. Uh, and then I have other thoughts. There's a ton of other stuff yeah. that we won't turn so, into. I, a... I love Navani. Um, I, the flashbacks, I think, were clearly the weakest of the first four. Yeah. One thing that I think is kind of weird in that, in hindsight, people are kind of acting like the two most featured characters in Rhythm of War were Navani and Venli, when purely factually, if you look at who is the most time, it's Kaladin. Yeah, and it's, it's, not, it's not particularly close. Yeah, yeah. And I also didn't love that oh, so okay, <laughs> anyway i love kaladin but yeah like i said i could have literally probably talk uh a good spoiler discussion why it just kind of, it didn't even miss with me like it's still a really good book but it just wasn't my favorite um, yeah I, I totally get why it's a lot of people's least favorite story in my book i also get why it's some people's favorite story in my book um yep. it's kind of i i totally agree it has like slightly different focus on characters mm -hmm. um i kind of love all the stormlight characters so it'd be hard to you'd have to brandon would almost have to try to have a focus group of stormlight characters for me to not like the book um he'd have to try really hard i will say like i'll say i'm not going to say who they are but we know who the flashback characters are for all 10 books i know some people don't want to know at all so i'm not going to say mm -hmm. um four and six based on flashbacks were the two i'm the least excited about so, I mean, I wasn't super excited about these flashbacks. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, Rhythm of War is just one of those things where, like, it's a lot of people's favorites. It, it was not mine. Um, I think the I, I hope editors reel them in a little bit. And I also think it's a partly me problem because when mysteries start to get solved, sometimes I lose interest. There's a lot of explaining in Rhythm of War that I actually got. And that's why I like soft magic systems. But uh, neither here nor there. We'll get to it now. Top three favorite trilogies. This is completely off the dome, so don't take this as like this is Jimmy's, you know, solidified list forever. Uh, I'm just gonna go first because I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, and I would say that my top three favorite trilogies. If you, it, it, we count Lord of the Rings as a trilogy, we do, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd say Lord of the Rings, Tawny Man, Memory Star, and Thorn. Hmm. Like strictly as a trilogy, probably Memory Star and Thor is number one. I think it's it's really close between Tawny Man and that. Tawny Man has a lot of recency bias because I just finished it. What about you? Um, so right now one and two, I'm gonna cheat and say one is Live Ship, two is Tawny Man. And if you ask me in three weeks, three will probably fits in the fool. Um, I don't read a ton of trilogies, so I guess three is Mistborn. 
um, or first law. Probably. Yeah. I know I like, I think I, those are close for me. I probably like Mistborn a little bit more, but um, one and two are very, very easily live ship and Tawny Man. And I have to think about the top two for zero seconds. Um, yeah. hmm. I have to think about the last one. And like I said, this is just off the top of my dome. I have been thinking about it a little bit, but like immediately what comes to mind is like Trevor Crumb is going to finish Age of Madness this fall. And I wouldn't be even be surprised if that took number one spot because like when I talk about trilogies, I talk, I think about a first book, middle book, like a trilogy structure, right? Uh, and Memory of Sorrow and Thorn did it damn near perfect. Like it is so impressive to me. Uh, that's a great question. That's a video. That's another video I'd literally like to do is like maybe a top yeah. five trilogies. It's kind just... of going to be hard for any trilogy to pass Live Ship and Tawny Man, considering like my least favorite book from that section is as good or better than the best books of most trilogies I've read. Mm. And right now I have my two favorite books ever as Ship of Magic and Fool's Errand. <laughs> yeah. So those are kind of hard to top. Well, I've um, said, I think Live Ships is a perfectly constructed trilogy. So I'm a bit of a hypocrite for not mentioning it in my... Um, in I just my assumed you were limiting yourself to one per I, author, which I is why I said to, I was cheating. I do try to do that, you know, because uh, if not, like if I did a top 10 in, favorite characters i mean i think half of them from from realm of the elderlings yeah i'm gonna have to do it i'm gonna do a top 10 characters list i've literally been waiting to do it until i was done realm of the elderlings um and i'm gonna have to limit it i i think i made a list if i didn't limit it to a certain amount per character and it had seven realm of the elderlings characters <laughs> yeah i i am gonna wait to do and, any top list until i finish malazan and I, I think it might it's i mean at the end of fits in the fool that might move up so it, yeah. it, it would end up being Robin Hobb and Rand and Dresden, which is not a particularly interesting list. Yeah. The Fool is my favorite character in fantasy right now, if anyone cares. Fantasy Bawa asks, any authors that are not so popular that you are planning to get to? I'm getting to Alexander Darwin's Combat Codes Book 3 right now. I have the advanced reader copy. And, uh, you know, it's it's really good. It's his first uh, published trilogy. And Combat Codes Book 1 was his first ever book. He self-published. And I just like it's a kind of a guilty pleasure, but I don't mean that in a negative con like connotation, like where I'm saying that like it isn't good. It's actually rather good. And it's just really different. Like I don't read this kind of stuff. It reads very much like um, I guess Will White's series. Like a lot of people compare it to that. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, the audiobook I thought for book two was really good. And I also thought book two was like a huge step up from book one. So that that would probably fall with that. I guess another author that's not super popular, and I Jake, I believe you've read him, is Brian Lee Durfee. And I, I have not read those yet. No. I mean he's popular, but like not as popular as I think he should be based on what I've heard about his books. And I'll be getting to those this year as well. What about you, Jake? Um I've got I don't think I have anyone who's like super not popular, but I have some that I plan to read. One of those is Durfee, who um Right now, I'm getting slightly restricted by uh, my sister got me book one for Christmas, except it didn't ship in time, and now it's stuck where she lives. Right. But I might not get it in time. Um, I don't know if Greenbone Saga counts as um, unpopular. I'm going to read that soon. Um, I don't know if Empire of Silence by Christopher Rukio counts I, as unpopular. Yeah, I think so. 3,000 ratings on Goodreads. I'm going to read that soon. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also hoping to start Senlin at some point. Again, I don't know if that counts, but I think, I, I, Oh, it is like 18,000 on Goodreads. It's anyway. Said, um, really blown up. Yeah. That's um, another one I'm going to try to get to next year. Very cool. Uh, has anyone read Tom Scott? I have not, but it's on my list and I know that that's going to be a pretty intense, uh, read. It's so good. I think she was talking about, um, Stormlight here. Are there fan? Also, hello, Noelle. Noelle is a new booktuber, and she's wonderfully spoken and uh, one of my favorite people I've met in the reading community. So go ahead and go over to her channel and give her some love. I think she just posted her second video ever, and I need to watch it this week. Maybe I did watch it already. There's so much booktube to catch up on, but Noelle is wonderful, and I'm glad she's here. Uh, Azure Paul says, are there fancy characters you love or hate to read more of in books? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Like, you know, do you want more dragons or less of some i'm assuming oh creature I yeah. some characters i'm sorry uh uh yeah worms yeah worms john gwen has them and i think it's awesome yeah oh, those are great it's worms right is that how you pronounce it yeah i don't know whatever i don't do i don't pronounce things right west virginia do education system did me good <laughs> um yeah i i kind of not so much less almost any time a fantasy creature comes up i'm very rarely like i don't really like that creature Give me more 
of almost all of them. Um, both the uh, the classic creatures, like, you know, dragons and whatnot, yeah. and when people come up with their own thing, like Kandra and Mistborn or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that was cool. That was actually really cool. I like that. Anyway, um, I'm not super picky on my fantasy creatures. Just yeah. give me more. Gwen does the best with creatures. Uh, he doesn't have the best animal companion of all time, but I think creature like John Gwen's world's always been good super him. alive. I love John. I love me some John Gwen. God damn it. The gentleman bastard has such witty humor. Red seas under red skies is fantastic. Rhythm wars. Yeah. I see a lot of people love rhythm of war. Like I've had more people tell me that it's their favorite rather than not their favorite. Um, it's funny. Cause I definitely, I think I've seen more people say it's their bottom of the Sanderson things. Anyways, I actually like two comments down is one thing. No disclaimer mentions that I absolutely agree with for rhythm of war is in terms of the antagonists Sanderson has, he has uh, le- leveled up a lot over yes. his career. Um, where at the Avenging start of his career, I think his antagonist was like a relative weakness of his writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are almost, I don't know, like four antagonists in Rhythm of War that are better than like any other antagonist he's written. Um, I can't say who really any of them are except for Rabonial. That's the only one that's not a spoiler. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, honestly... Sanderson, I, I don't think anyone could argue that Sanderson's writing is not getting better. Uh, I, th- I think it's definitely getting better. There's still little things that bother me. Uh, for instance, this is a pet peeve of mine. I'm not saying this is objective, but uh, Dalinar side audibly. Kaladin side audibly. I don't like the side and then followed by the descriptor. I think it's just so super silly. Now I'm going to notice that. Why would oh, you do this to me? I could I could do it all day. There, Please there's stop. A, uh, Chris Bookish Cauldron has said this, and I agree, is that like there's things once you notice them about his prose that become very clunky and problematic for, as a reader that is looking for those things. And once you see it, 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 it hurts. It hurts it a lot. Uh, so don't look for it. It's <laughs> just don't yeah. look for it. Also, it does. It doesn't have to bother you. I'm not saying it has to, but that's just something for me in the way that I, I, I go about my reading, I guess. It's just something I pick up on. Um, His characters say er instead of um, and it bothers me. That's the only er, one. That's... Yeah, I've never said er in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I see a lot of authors do that where people say er instead of um, uh, when yeah. they mean um, and uh, it's weird. I don't get it. I've never heard anyone say er. Everyone that's says funny. um. Brian has another quick question. Do you guys have any thoughts on the Witcher series? No, I've only played the video games and I like the TV show. Season two trailer drops tomorrow, by the way. Uh, I've read the Witcher. Um, it didn't really stand out to me. Um, it was kind of like, I didn't dislike the Witcher. They kind of all ranged from like, okay to pretty good. Um, it's not a series I regularly recommend just cause there's so many series I like more. Mm-hmm. Um, I have heard that if you can read it in Polish, it's fantastic. And that the translation is pretty rough. But I've heard that as well. I'd be hard pressed to recommend The Witcher over so many other series that I just like way more. Yeah, I, I haven't read it. And it's like one of those things where like I'm getting I got a lot of satisfaction from The Witcher video games. Like I liked all three of them and I enjoy uh, Witcher Tales, which is a really cool isometric RPG that has its battles played out with Gwent scenarios that are like puzzles. Really cool game. I feel like I've gotten enough of that universe. And I need to miss it before I read the books or I think I'll burn out on it. And I really like the TV show. Uh, you know, it's good fun. It's it's a lot, a lot of fun. I'm really excited for that trailer to drop tomorrow for The Witcher. Make sure to follow him on Twitter and check that out. Noel is awesome, Alan. You're yeah, totally right. I haven't seen Noel's channel. I will have to. Oh, you definitely out. should. Her first video, I said, you know, me and you have talked about this before about like first videos are always terrible. Her vi- first video is actually really good. <laughs> like it's what? Yes, it's very good. And it's like, oh, no, booktubers are leveling up. Like they're 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 evolving. <laughs> oh, you're you're allowed to just start booktube is good. Oh, I, I didn't know that was a thing. I did watch Noelle's. It was her TBR because it was absurdly good. Her TBR was good. I knew. I thought I watched it because I have alerts on for her. So yes, I did watch your other video, Noelle, and it was also very good. Um, I feel like they're you know they're s- stepping on the backs of giants. You know, I, I feel like we've set the path yeah it's all us it's me all us. you alex alan christian yeah. um you know yeah we get all the credit for sure I agree. <laughs> you know you were class 2020 right book yeah two class 20 okay yeah it, we're trying to get really tribal uh tribalism about it uh okay so. that i'm fine with that more wolves i would say that but the the best wolf of all time has already been written yeah so it can't like be hard. talked 
No, but Although, I'm actually down. A pack of wolves would be sweet. Yeah, you can keep adding more wolves, and I'll still like them all, and they'll still never be the best wolf. Um, thoughts on Urban Fantasy? I think it's got massive potential, not a book series, but anyone who likes fantasy should know what World of Darkness is. It's so cool. Cool. I have. I, I actually don't know what that is, but I'll check it out. Um, I don't know either. So Urban Fantasy has been flipped on its head by Dark Tower for me. I love it. I'm yeah, in. I'm actually... It's funny. I wouldn't call myself... There's like one urban fantasy series that I really like. I need to read more of it. I've got some other urban fantasy series on my TBR, um, but I, that I need to get to eventually. To yeah. I, I don't know if I can really say I'm like an urban fantasy fan. I've read one urban fantasy series multiple times. Does that count? No. Yes, it does, okay. I think. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, I read Ninth House and also really enjoyed it uh, by Lee Bardugo. It's her first for, uh, foray into adult fantasy, and I, I actually really liked it. Like I know some people give uh, give it shit, but I, I really enjoyed it. It caught me off guard. I almost DNF'd it in the first two chapters, and then I kept going, and I was like, wow, this is really good. I read Shadow and Bone when I was like, I don't know, 13 or 14. And all I remember is that like 14 year old me was bored by Shadow and Bone and 14 year old me was not as picky as current me. But I think I've been told she improves a lot. So I have like Ninth House is another one that's on my TBR, but like pretty far down. It, it's a unique book is the best way I'd put it. I said it was like Harry Potter meet Six Sense on bath salts is how I described it, I believe, in my review. <laughs> <laughs> um head cannon asks what are y'all's favorite fantasy movie slash tv shows that aren't adaptations lord of the rings no i'm just kidding <laughs> um i don't watch that many movies and tv shows um Hello? you know how earlier i said that movies and tv shows have advantages that books don't the advantage that i care about is that books i can get in people's heads and it's just it's my preferred medium of storytelling yeah um this is a pretty hard one because there's really not a lot of good things out there, uh, to be honest, that aren't adapt adaptations. Um, well, I, think I keep Willow. thinking of good things and then being like, no, that's an ad adaptation. Yeah. I mean, if you go sci-fi, that's easy, right? I mean, there's plenty of shows to pick from with that. Um, some of them are, you know, as some put Avatar The Last Airbender. I haven't seen it all, but yeah. I you know I, what? I, I'm, I'm just going to say it. Star Wars is fantasy. I pick the original Star Wars trilogy. Fine. Yeah. The force is magic. Deal with it. I'm in. Metachlorians are bullshit. I'm down. Uh, I've only read Last Witch and it was meh. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like one of the better Witcher novels as well. Yeah. Um, it, It's not a good sign when even like the Witcher mega fans are like, yeah, the games are better. I mean, the games are masterpieces. Yes, that's Book Blue Pass of 2020. That's right, Alan. We got it. These 2021 ers, you know, they need to recognize that back in our day, okay, yeah. it wasn't so easy to go get a Canon M50 and buy some box lights, okay? Yeah. Yeah. You know, back in my day. <laughs> back in my day. World, World of Darkness RPG. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. I always learn something from these. This is like my favorite thing. I, it's either from the guest or from the chat. I always go away with like things written down in text edit. And then I get to search them after like me. I, you probably didn't get to see it, Jake, because I know you usually work Friday nights. But me and Christian had this big, long discussion the last last time he was on two weeks ago about metal music that was influenced by fantasy. And I did not realize. I mean, there's like hundreds. I, I know there's um there's like a Led Zeppelin song that's influenced a there's couple of Lord of the Rings, but I'm sure there's a lot more. Yeah. You know, Led Zeppelin had more than one. They had a ton. Yeah, I, I know of like two. There's a band that's completely Misty dedicated. Yeah, there's a band that's completely dedicated to Game of Thrones, uh, like A Song of Ice and Fire. This is before the show uh, that was completely dedicated to those books. There's a, a good amount of Robin Hobb inspired songs. Yeah, you know, you know the poem that's in Tawny Man. Yeah, yeah. There's a song for it. Huh. It's okay. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> I've heard better. Um, but yeah, that was like a really cool. You know, I always come out of these, like I said, uh, just just kind of learning. Have you read the Broken Earth trilogy? I have not, and I think it literally might be number one to read in 2022. It's either that or Empire of Silence. Yeah, I'm gonna. I I had a big list of TBR books, and I didn't know which I wanted to read first, so I let Alan Bot on his Discord decide which I read first, and it broke Broken Earth. So that'll be not super soon, but probably late 2021 or early 2022. 
Yeah, and that's a trilogy, you know, and that's why like I've kind of held off. If you've noticed, if you've been around the Fantasy Network for a minute, and you've been hanging around with your boy Jimmy, you know that I don't have a ton of like top five, top ten videos. I do at the end of the year. I like doing those, um, but I don't have like an all time list because I just don't think I have enough under my belt yet. I think after 2021, maybe halfway through 2022, I'll feel a lot more comfortable about making a lot of those top lists because I don't want to have to yeah. correct them every year. <laughs> you think- know. Right now, my plan is for the yearly top 10 list to be at the end of the year and the all-time ones to be in the middle. Although I was convinced that instead of doing a top 10 um, series list, I'm going to do a series of 10 videos, one for each series of just why I love them, because that sounds fun. Anyway, um, I'm actually, I'm going to jump back to the Allen bot picking it because it actually did obtain sentience and forgot to be sentient when it picked the fifth season because <laughs> the next two series it picked after the fifth season out of like 10 was guards guards and then Senlin. Oh wow. I mean that's pretty so, good. Yeah, that's, you know that's Alan. Straight up Alan like hacked the matrix and dude, was like Alan bought his me. I'm gonna tell you what, uh there is a good chance that Terry Pratchett's gonna weasel his way into like my top five or top three author. Like I, I've only read Mort. My review will be out next week. And I loved I loved it. I loved it. I love uh, it was a breath of fresh air and I was surprised by the depth of the story and how much it actually encompassed in a short amount of time. And while also being really lighthearted and kind of like, you know, like airy almost, but not in a bad way. I don't know. I was very impressed with Mort and I heard it only gets better from there. So I'm really excited about uh, Discworld. Yeah. For, so Mort is the only project book I've read. Uh, I didn't like it as much as you. Um, I didn't. Okay. I basically I thought it was I thought it was hilarious. Like. Oh, yeah. Um, and I really like death, but the actual story itself, I was somewhat meh on. Hmm. Um, so I liked the first half where it was basically just the characters being the characters and, you know, death being amazing, um, and exploring the world more than the second half, which kind of focused on actually having a plot that I just didn't, you, wasn't that interested by. Oh, you're going to hate my review. I, I rave about how, how the plot actually ended up being really interesting. So you'll, you'll I probably won't hate your review. Yeah, but, you're going to hate you know. it. Okay, sure. I'll downvote it. Comment <laughs> all caps, five paragraphs on why it's dumb and unsubscribe. Yeah, sure. You have to hate me as a person if, if you don't agree with me. Exactly. That's yeah, how for sure. Two works. Yeah. Uh, Alan says this live show is keeping me from reading, but it's too much fun. Hey, Alan, if you want to come on to chatting with nuts, we can. Ha- I'll tell you what. You come on. We'll have it out about the last two books of uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. It might get a little spicy in here. Also, I- Alan, I thought it was keeping you from shooting Geth. Did you switch your plans from Listen, playing Mass Effect to reading? Alan's a busy man. He's got a lot of plans. Yeah, he can. Mass Effect's really good, though. I don't even really play single player games, but oh. I've played Mass Effect multiple times. Yeah, I mean, I, I love Mass Effect. I'm waiting. I'll, I'll play the remaster around Christmas. I think. I, I you could, if you look at my Goodreads and sort my red books by date read, you can see where I started and finished um, playing Mass Effect by the slowdown in reading. Yeah, um, that's so funny. Yeah, I'm. Dude. I'm Ah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I'm really excited about this. And I want to see if you're playing it or anybody else. Um, and I'll get off this subject very quickly because I could go on and on. I just pl- started playing Chivalry 2, and I'm, I was a big Mordhau player. Chivalry 2, oh my god. I'm just like role-playing as Gorst from First Law, and I have this big knight with this squeaky little voice. And he's just <laughs> running amazing. in. Like, I'm, I mean, I am. I'm going to be honest, people. I'm leading the scoreboard every time in Chivalry 2. Your boy was meant to be a knight. Mm. I'm 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 better at killing death than I am at the middle. I'm so Mass Effect three when it first came out, it had the multiplayer that originally was kind of thrown on, but somehow ended up being so good. So I played that a lot. So unlike Alan, who's apparently getting wrecked on insanity, yeah, I, see I that. so I don't know what game he's on. Um, Mass Effect two is, in my opinion, the hardest by far right now in the Something remastered on insanity. I went from I barely died in Mass Effect one. Um, and then I died constantly in Mass Effect 2, and then I barely died in Mass Effect 3. Mass Effect should be made into a trilogy movie series. I oh, it'd be, it could be so good, that. right? Like, when talking about good sci-fi, I mean, Mass Effect is one of the best pieces of sci-fi of all time. I absolutely love it, man. I, oh, I, yeah, okay, you're on ME2. Yeah, ME2's hard. Uh, you're on your own for that. Especially, there's some missions on ME2 that are just brutal. Um, there's, I think there's three on ME2 that I probably died a huge number of times on. And it's Horizon, the collector base, and that last damn shutter recruiting Archangel. And yes, I remember to not spoil things and call them Archangel. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, he says agreed, Master of Storytelling. It, it, it really is. Um, yeah. 
I'm going to pivot back to the books here. Yeah, uh, good idea. How, how many people have? Uh, well, there's a reason. So we got what, 20? So this is something that, uh, and no disclaimers question is, Jimmy, what are your thoughts on the upcoming House of the Dragons HBO show? Um, I'm To answer that question, to get to my next point, uh, it, I'm very excited. Uh, has everyone that I want to be involved with the show and the people who I don't want involved are not involved. D and D have nothing to do with it. Uh, all of the people who made some of the best episodes unanimously considered from the fan base in game of Thrones are working on house of the dragon. George is involved. I'm in, I don't care. I know a lot of people are like, ah, I'm done, but I'm not. Uh, I love Westeros, my favorite world. And I love the Targaryen history. And speaking of that, I've been reading fire and blood, having a good time. I've never read it cover to cover. I've read uh, pretty much everything in it, like at one time or another, but I've never just sat down and read it. So with that said, I think I'm going to do a fire and blood read along as my first ever read along on the channel. I think I'm going to do it January, February, March, and April, and that'll lead us right into house of the dragon. And I think it'll give people a really good idea of what to expect and what to get excited for, for the show. So that's something that I was waiting on announcing, but I guess we could just consider an announcement now. I'll eventually announce it down the road. But if anyone's interested in that in the chat, let me know. Um, I think I am. I mean, um, that it's not a book that I think a lot of people are going to itch, even if you're a big fan, like to pick it's a history book. But I think if you read it in parts with other people and we talk about it and we say, oh, this connects heat, I think it could be a lot of fun. Because it feels like Fire and Blood is one of those books that I always want to read it, but I never want to read it now. I totally agree. Um, and so, yeah, a read along, I think would be great because I've had that setting on my shelf for quite a while. Um, also, I saw a random comment that didn't come up because I was scrolling up and I'm just going to mention it. Um, Catherine mentioned how great the creatures are in Codex Alera, and just I agree, they're fantastic. Oh, I the Canem are great. Anyway, yeah, so that's all, uh, I, that's all I want to mention. So yeah, if you if anyone has been interested in reading Fire Blood, or you already have you already have read it, want to talk about it, I think my first ever read along is going to be like Jan One doing Fire and Blood. Um, I'm and definitely I'm, in for. I'm that. really excited. So I'm about 180 pages into. I've just been reading like 10 pages a night for like a while now, and it's. It's really good. Like I, 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 I'm very pumped. I think there's a lot to talk about. So I'll get off that uh, high horse now, but I'm glad someone kind of asked me about that. Uh, and yes, I am excited for the show. Uh, Pratchett is my number one. Uh, did you read the Lightbringer series by Brent Weeks? I loved it. I have not read it. Um, it's something that has slid down my TBR, if I'm being honest, because I, I don't have a spoiled ending, but I know where the ending goes. And knowing myself as a human being, I don't know if I'm going to love it. Yeah. I really liked book one. I like book two more. I like book three more. Uh, book four was on my least favorite books of 2020 list. And it was pretty high up that list. Um, and then book five, I liked the first three quarters of it. And then um, I recently record, you know, the uh, no disclaimers tag. And mm -hmm. one of the questions is a good book that got ruined by an ending. That, that book was mentioned for that part of oh, that wow. tag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it hurts because I, I really liked book three. There was one character who I love their wrap up in the last book. Um, I, uh, but only one. Yeah, so. I don't know. It's one. Maybe I'll get to it, uh, but I, I don't know when I really don't. Alan says, uh, Jimmy, I want to be on chatting with nuts. Your your invitation is officially in the mail and you can answer it right now in two weeks if you want to come on. 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, I'd be more than glad to have you. I think it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I think Alan uh, on chatting, that's like, I could definitely see that going well. Yeah, I think it'd be good. Um, it looks like a lot of people are saying that they're in for the um, for the Fire and Blood. So that's exciting to see, because I think that's going to take a lot of work on my end. And I want to know that people are going to do it. I did actually put up a, a poll um and i'm gonna fish that up while i put this question up and it says uh did either of you two ever get into the destiny video game lore i only played destiny 2 and i didn't understand I, I didn't care about the lore uh not saying it's bad I, I just didn't delve into it jake what about you i didn't play the game at all so therefore I didn't get into the lore yeah uh, maybe i should though maybe i should um, so yeah, I put up a poll. I'm looking at it right now about a month ago. I actually had 158 votes. It said, would anyone be interested in fire blood read along by George R. R. Martin? And 55% of people said yes. So what's 55% of 158, Jake? You're in college. Come on. No, the, everyone knows people who do uh, college. We can do fancy things, but forget how to do basic math. 
Oh my! Said fifty-eight per. What did you say? Was the fifty-five percent? Uh, so eighty-six out of one hundred and fifty-eight people said they. So if I had eighty-six people tuning in for those discussion shows, I would definitely do that. I have no problem with that. Uh, yeah, you should have been asking Alan. He's the t- oh, he teaches Latin, whatever, not <laughs> math, but still a teacher. That counts. Um, eighteen percent said I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I thought I thought that was actually really funny. Yeah, it's like well, so, years, so it's good. The fire good and math. blood Goodreads reviews pissed me off so much because all the negative reviews oh, are no. not this is bad. It's all why isn't this Winds of Winter? Yeah, it gets a little, <laughs> it gets a little tiring. Uh, I'll be honest. And hey, I didn't. In, one sec, I didn't insult Latin teaching, Alan. I was just saying you're not a math teacher, so that wouldn't help you do the math. Come on, sorry, sorry, I interrupted you there, Jimmy. No, you're good. Latin is the language of the gods. Um, it's hard to find vocal uh, song by Sapphire. I'll tell you who you can check out is Ben the Knee. Uh, they're really, really good friends of mine, and they have a podcast, and it's a read along. Uh, they also do like current news within the fandom and whatnot, and they have a YouTube channel, and they've been posting a lot of Fire and Blood content. I'll be honest, I'm probably going to see if they want to collaborate on the Fire and Blood read along, and I think they're going to say yes because they're like my best friends. <laughs> um, so we'll we'll see how it is um, whenever the time comes. That, that's that's a kind of a ways away. I know it's. We're almost halfway through the year. It's crazy. Uh, Oscar says he's in as well. So yeah, that's something I can get really excited about. I don't know. I love talking about a song of ice and fire. What I don't love is constantly having to answer the question. Well, what about season eight? stuff like that? You know? So even though it's my favorite series of all time, I, I actually try not to mention it as much just because some of the same old, same old stuff. Now the, the debates about the books, whenever it comes to like, which ones are good and bad, I actually find that to be kind of fun. Because it's about the books. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but the discourse of whether George owes me a book or this, I I don't find that conversation interesting at all. Um, I know Jay from Caption Works just posted that video and I just like got it. The conversation, go, which is great. That's good. Some people want to have a conversation. I don't like I just don't find it to be worth my time. Uh, because there is no correct answer. <laughs> yeah, also it's not gonna change anything, whether you yeah. think he owes you a book or he owes you absolutely nothing. Yes. And I fall somewhere in the middle uh, on most things. I'm a perpetual fence sitter and I can be convinced one way or the other. Um, generally, I have a, a way I, I lean towards. Right. But yeah, I don't know. I But when it comes to actually talking about the books, like if we did a fire and blood read along and we were talking about the material that George has written down, which I think is excellent. I'm totally in. Totally. Yeah. Especially since a song of ice and fire lore and like theories yeah. are so intricate. Yeah. Um, there's definitely a lot to talk about there. Yeah. And some of the history, man, like, you know, obviously the main series is wild because we get to see it all play out. But there's some crazy stuff in the Targaryen history. Like, yeah. Magor was the, the cruel for a reason. That dude was bad news. Yeah, I've read, I've got like the textbook, like the World of Ice and Fire, and yeah. it's obviously way less in depth. But there's some wild stuff there. Yeah. Um, some really wild stuff. Um, and also there's some people. Every I'm so suspicious of that textbook. Every time that textbook says someone was like great and all well loved, I'm like he was secretly an asshole, wasn't he? Yeah, it's so fun. Uh, I love the story that he wanted to print it out with an ink blop on the actual page, but the publishers wouldn't let him do it because there were how many yeah. books they would return. Like people would be returning the book thinking that oh, they yeah. got a messed up paper. <laughs> My favorite is the bit in a World of Ice and Fire about Robert as king, and it's like all praise. It's like he's <laughs> such a great king. Now we live in like a time of peace and glory, and I'm just you're just kind of like, and that's of course that's at the end. So then you kind of go like, wait, what did I just read? Hey, listen, mm. we don't slander Bobby B in <laughs> on the Nancy Network. We are Baratheon loyalists here. Yeah, okay. I like Bobby B, but was he a fantastic and perfect king who brought about an age of peace and wealth? Uh, I just uh, I just wrote 14,000 words of a story. It's, it's going to be short story slash novel, novella. I'll probably never. Uh, well, I shouldn't say I'll never release it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Didn't yet. you say that was selling out earlier? Well, yeah, this? I'm almost at 3,000 subs. That's oh, yeah. So you have to sell it. Okay. Um, no, I've always had some interest in writing and the whole premise. And I've said this before. I think I've talked to Noel. Uh, for some reason, I remember Noel re- responding to this. I think it was on one of these. But uh, the whole idea of what if Bobby B had picked up the Warhammer one one time, one last time, right? Like, what if he hadn't just sat back and drank himself to death? What if what if he had caught himself right before he he went too far and he stood up and, you know, smashed a land? I thought I just think it's like a really cool idea. So my entire short story is like based around that premise. It's also blossomed into something much more. I feel but, like the uh, 
George R. R. Martin thing to happen is it's like, oh, no, no, he's fat now. He he fell off his horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get the breastplate stretch. <laughs> uh, um, what was I going to say? I, I have sometimes I have like, oh, that'd be a cool idea, but I never really want to write it. I just want other people to write it. So please yeah. go write my ideas, other people. Um, <laughs> I had one, and it came from playing Mass Effect, knowing everything, oh, and that some that. decisions in Mass Effect are harder when you know all the consequences. And the idea was basically a character who completely sees time, like what the consequences of all his actions are. And that makes it really hard to choose what to do because it's like, you know, yeah. I'm going to go to the grocery store and it's like, oh, should I get this bread or this bread? And it's like, you know, he knows everything that happened. So instead of being, oh, it doesn't matter. It's like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Anyways, someone should write that. It'd be cool. Yeah, I have a, I have another pretty uh, wide idea. Oh, we'll, we'll say that. it's a bigger idea. And you know how we were talking about like really good ideas don't always make good books. I'm like, man, I wish I could give this to somebody for them to write. <laughs> yeah, because you know, if I write a really good idea, that's I'm gonna try to write it. I'm gonna do a subpar job because you know I'm not a writer, but we'll see what happens. I guess but you'll try. Yeah, I'll give it the I'll give it the good old college try. Maybe somebody will be inspired and rip me off, and it'll be way better, and I'll be all about it. Um, Stewart says his House of the Dragon about Dance of uh, the Dragons. That yes, yes, it is. Uh, unless if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure i'm right um no disclaimer says what are y'all's top five or oh, God, i can't read today top three is song of ice and fire characters uh i'm gonna let you go first uh one would be jamie two uh, gets probably Tyrion. three is hard um that is hard who is three man i it gets so much harder after the top two. My top two is pretty easy. Jamie, I think, has one of the best character arcs in the genre. Tyrion is just so well fleshed out and entertaining. Mm -hmm. But who would be three? I gave you the first two, so now I think it's your time. To, oh, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I know, I know someone who has Theon as a second favorite character, and I think, oh, I can't talk about that. Yeah, I. Ah, no disclaimers. <laughs> Ned Stark's a good pick from Alan. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll copy Alan, but put him third. I mean, Alan likes the uh the honorable guy who stands for his principles, so it makes sense that uh Alan would really like Ned Stark, but I really like Ned Stark as well. Yeah, I I, I quite like Ned Stark. Um I think mine. Whew, that's hard. That's hard. I it's changed a lot over the years, too, by the way. And I know this, I'm going to reread in the fall and I know it's going to change again. Uh, I would say three is the hardest spot for me to pick because it's the interchangeable one. I'm going to say Brienne, Jamie, Tyrion, Tyrion number one. And, and that is hard to pick because Theon and Ned Stark and Bobby Baratheon are all up there. And I, Honestly, I love Davos. I used to think. Davos, oh, yeah. Davos is great as well. Yeah. I used to think Davos was like, I used to like kind of dread his chapters like the first time. I think maybe the first two times I read through the series. And now, like, I look fondly back on those. And it's the same thing with Brienne. I've become I, very I attached to Brienne. Still dread the Brienne chapters a little bit. Really? I don't dislike her. She's just. I mean, I. It's because in, oh, in Feast for Crows, it's that she would be a good enough character. She's like, I like her enough that if she was doing things I was interested in, I would really like her character, but I don't like her. She's not in the tier of characters that I can like read about doing anything. Okay. Like I can read about Tyrion, do anything. Like I can read about Fitz at this point, do anything. Yeah. That's um, Bren is not in that tier. And I just don't find what she's doing. Interesting. Um, that's more the events in the chapters than the characters itself that I'm not really big on. Yeah. Loved her in a storm of swords. Yeah. I love everything's great in a storm of swords. Yeah. It's, my favorite um i i also really like john snow in the books uh Same, yeah. I, he was very poorly adapted clearly uh <laughs> it's this gray worm top 10 you know what maybe i don't know catch me catch me on a weird day i might slip him in there. uh he fits very perfectly in a line because like he's up and down from the side it's a okay. joke That's yeah <laughs> theon's definitely up there as well uh, I think Theon is great. Uh, there's not a lot of characters I dislike. 
in a song of ice fire i'm openly biased so the real question is if we bring up alan's latest comment uh, who is this J O H N Snow? I don't remember that as a character in the book. Is that just like a random northern bastard? Because I remember the great character that obviously Alan would never say bad things about J O N Snow, but um, <laughs> I don't I don't remember uh, John spelt like that Snow in the books. Who who is that character, Alan? Can you let us know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think John Snow in the books is a, is a lot better uh, than what we got in the show, and I like Kit Harrington fine, but. Uh, I think they missed the point pretty strongly with him. No Daenerys love. Daenerys goes in and out for me. It just depends. It just depends. I think her chapters in the Game of Thrones are pretty hard to get through. Um, not because they're like terrible or anything, but because she's so disconnected from the rest of the story that sometimes she can feel jarring. Uh, but it's not so much um, uh, insult to her. Where's the onion? I mean, Davos could, like I said, he could easily be in there. He could easily be in there. Perfect accumulation. <laughs> yeah, I didn't understand. <laughs> Why do you dislike John? So he's in on the screen. The reason behind the spread of cold. <laughs> 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 like a freaking marine for a million. Yeah, the Mar uh, the Marinese knot is tied tight. It's tied tight. Mistakes were made, possibly. Who knows? But um, uh, you know, there's so many good side characters too. Uh, Manderleys. What what a house. I love the Manderleys so much. Um, and I also really like Euron. Uh, you're on that. I mean, that's the worst adaptation by far. Oh, uh, in by yeah, yeah, it's not even close. It's uh, insulting almost, or not even almost. The yeah. you're on adaptation is just insulting. Yeah, you're on in the show, and I said this in my first ever video. In the show, was a backwoods edge lord, Bam Margera. Uh, in the books, he is a kraken apocalyptic catalyst, like, he's, he's yeah. such a big deal. And I think that Euron has so much potential. Like Euron could literally become the best antagonist in fantasy uh, if done proper. Uh, and there's so many cool theories about him. And there's also the thing that I, that kind of bothers me and it doesn't get enough love. And I understand if it's not important to you, but it is for me, there are so many mythological symbols, like connections in a song of ice and fire. And if you want to see more of that, go to Lu uh, Lucifer means Lightbringer here on YouTube I that that guy has written thousands, tens of thousands of pages and now turning them into videos uh, of essays connecting mythology to a song of ice and fire and their equivalents. And it is awesome. It's awesome. Sounds some, yeah, sounds interesting. I was gonna, I know you mentioned a lot for Hobb and George R. Martin how you like that word choice matters. And that's one reason I think you'll really you'll like I think you'll like King Killer more than me. That's a series. I like King Killer, but I don't like love King Killer. Yeah. Um King Killer is definitely one where not only does like the word choice matter, sometimes like even phonetically where you'll have words and then you realize that's actually like a mistranslation over a thousand years of a different thing yes. that was somewhere else. And yeah. um, in terms of word, word choice mattering, Rothfuss is really good at that. So I think you'll probably really like that aspect of King Killer. Yeah, I'll take a book every five years that has that kind of thing. Then a, oh, every five years. That's I mean, yeah, yeah we're, if we're lucky. But I'm thinking like even eh, whoever, right? Like, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is I'll even wait a long period of time if the book is going to have that kind of content in it. That is just me. That is what I love. I love when a word choice pays off 3000 pages later. I think it's just incredible. Um, they, I, they, that's like what gets me to reread. You know, I don't reread a lot. I really don't. Uh, Lord of the Rings, Song of Ice Fire. That's really it uh, as of right now of what I do uh, reread. Uh, Benjamin, hi, Benjamin, says, are John Quinn's books like a combination of the sensibilities of Gurham and Sanderson? Ben. Hmm. Yes, hmm. kind of, maybe. Huh. You know, I think whenever I reviewed Gwen's first series, Faith from the Fallen, I, I, I said I get why this is a, like, for people who liked Game of Thrones, check out this. But it is so much different, and and this is the reason why. I think Gurm's mission was to set out to turn a lot of fantasy tropes on their head. John Gwynn leans into every single fantasy trope. John yeah, Gwynn wrote fantasy tropes, which I love. He's, so. He reminds you why you love the fantasy trope in the first place, because yeah. you can't turn a trope on its head if it doesn't become super popular first, mm. because it's really popular for a reason, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it is classical fantasy with a modern twist and very little plot armor and some of my favorite modern characterizations 
I've always said this and people are probably tired of hearing me say this, but with as little real estate as possible on paper, John Gwen can get over a character with his audience. And that's yeah. a selling point to John Gwen. Yeah. I would say like for John Gwen, if you look at how long it takes to get invested, he is one of the shortest times. He doesn't quite hit the high levels of investment as me. Um, I consider Robert Jordan almost the opposite where there are characters that I straight up don't like for six books. But then once I get invested in them, he hits a very, very, very high level of investment. And then I guess now that I think about it, Robin Hobb is both. Because I get invested instantly. <laughs> Hobb, I need to Hobb stop comparing great. things to Hobb. It's unfair. Yeah, Hobb's the goat. Um, you know, I'm five books deep in the Wheel of Time. I finished five of them. And I still hate Matt. So can does it get better? I like I Matt him. after five. I really hate him. Matt after five. Hate him. Wish he died. Can't no. stand him. Worst. Oh, God. When I read him, I'm just like, wow, he's a shitty friend. A shitty friend and a shitty person. I don't want him on the page anymore. <laughs> Is he a shitty person, though? Oh, yes. He's a uh, dude. I think I, I, I could... I could make a half hour video of me just dumping on Matt. You can ask uh, Patrick and uh, Christian from Lost and Discovery. <laughs> they know how I feel about Matt. <laughs> I wish <laughs> I wish they had all died. <laughs> like the interesting thing about. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh... Oh, man. What were you I, saying? Didn't, your... I didn't even know Alan had red eye of the world. News to me. Anyway, oh, has it. Um, messing with you. Like I actually, Matt obviously starts off as not the most trustworthy person. I actually think if you look from almost like book three on at Matt and Perrin, Matt is more reliable almost every time. Oh, I love Perrin. Yeah, Perrin is actually less reliable than Matt. If you actually look at what he was supposed, like what his he should be doing and what he actually does. Yeah. Matt complains about it the entire way and says like that he's not trying to do it. But Matt is actually like, if you have to get someone to do something and you have a task, your success rate is the highest. If you said, well, probably Rand. Yeah, but he never, he never chooses to do it. It's always the Tavirin thing. And like, so, I'm, okay. I'm he always could it. not do it, but then he, what he really like, all right. So there's a part in book five where he kind of ends up being helpful, like near the end where he mm -hmm. wasn't supposed to. Um, and while, yeah, you can say, like, Ty Viram forced him to do it, he also could have just left everyone to die. Well, he tried. No, he, he was going to, and then he was like, I can't leave everyone here to die. So then he's like, fuck it, I'll save them. Yeah. But he had, he could have just left. But then it's like, he, he kind of is like, okay, if I leave, I have to leave a bunch of people to die, and he's not going to. Listen, I've always been told when people tell you who they are, you listen. And I Yeah, think don't, Matt, Matt, Matt I think Matt's a coward. I think he's a coward. I think... And a shitty friend. <laughs> Dave, not a great you're... friend to Rand. I'll totally give you that. On the first um, episode of this podcast, Matt uh, Brady from Bend the Knee said this, and I wanted to see if what if you've ever heard this. Did you ever realize that Rand is Superman? No. Yeah, farm boy, reluctant to take up the title. Like, and there's a lot more than that. There's actually like a lot of people. Uh, like, this is not a uh, a niche thing. Like, uh, they, basically, Robert Jordan did take Superman's story and give it to Rand. It's a, and I'm not saying I that mean, as a knock. I think it's really. I cool. think Robert Jordan was also kind of like, you know, being Superman, except Rand, you know, doesn't get to be immune to bullets. Um, would really suck in a lot of ways. Because I mean, yeah. I I think if you look at like the uh, the hypothesis for the Wheel of Time. The main ones are one being the chosen one would absolutely suck balls. Like it would be terrible. It'd be the yeah. worst. I mean, and that um, is kind of what Superman's about too. And two, um, even if there was just a straight, like pure bad, pure evil, the dark one, um, yeah. it would, the people ever, like all the people would not stop like scheming and backstabbing to unite against the, the big bad. They would all keep doing that. And it would be very, very hard to unite against the big bad. Some would say it would even take 14 books. I mean, if you uh, think about it, George also wrote from that perspective, right? I, I actually, I just, he wrote from the perspective of like, people just aren't even aware of the big bad. He no, almost wrote, I mean, aware. no, most people in Westeros just don't even believe it exists. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But like, they but get like proof. people in, yeah. But I mean, like if you go tell someone Westeros, yeah, there's white walkers. Most of the answers will be 
No, there isn't. You're insane. If you tell someone, yeah, there's a dark one, everyone in Randland, which is okay, so you're, you're it, saying it's like, it's a reality. like everyone is 100% aware that the dark one is 100% a thing that exists. Okay. And that there are people who are dark friends. Um, and that they would, you know, destroy the world if they could. That is a thing that is known and accepted. Yeah, it's and a they still are. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not like, you know, white George is like, it would be very, very hard to convince people that the White Walkers are coming. And well, yeah, they tried. They tried. But uh they even had a really terrible plan in the show. Oh. Um but uh yeah, they tried, but trying is step one to failing. So <laughs> there you go. Um but yeah, I think those are kind of the two main hypotheses for wheel of time and yeah. that's kind of man it really would suck to be the chosen one though yeah and i mean and superman's also a very it's okay i mean that, that's a very much at the root of that story in, in those comics i think as well uh which is probably why a lot of people pull that parallel also coming from a farm all that good stuff yeah and um, i i think like rand one reason i find his story really interesting is if you look at any one of rand's problems other than like the main one like any of his small problems mm -hmm. where you are he could easily deal with any one of the problems. Like, no problem with the yeah. resources he has. The problem is he has, like, all of the problems. I remember after, like, I think I forget if it was after book five or book six, I made a to-do list for Rand. And it was like, <laughs> damn, <laughs> you got problems. <laughs> That's funny. Um, man, he really has a lot of stuff he needs to get done. Yeah, he sure um, does. And it's kind of, it reminds me, if there was ever a total war game for Wheel of Time, um, the Rand faction would be like super strong, but you just have it'd be like chaos. It'd be the most fun faction to play, um, and it'd be great. Anyway, um, I I think that that would actually be kind of cool to see like Balefire like shooting every like that could be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Wheel of Time video game. They they made one. It was actually really highly rated. It just came out at a bad time way back in the day. It was a first person shooter type game, which is crazy. Um, yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah, um, with tropes uh, and i, I kind of thought of this because my least favorite trope is the reluctant hero um I, I i hate it uh what is your least favorite trope in the fantasy? that's funny i really like the reluctant hero <laughs> um my least favorite trope is probably the like mustache like the people who's their characters that they're evil uh so voldemort yeah. sauron yeah um, i know sauron has more in the silmarillion yeah. but like in lord of the rings sauron is just evil yeah, I, that's true. I, I think that we're at a point now, though, um, where everyone wants to make really great characters. And sometimes like John Gwynn gives us this a lot. Uh, just like this person sucks. I hate so, them. <laughs> and I, like, I kind of like it. There are some people who are all bad. Like, actually, here's one I'll give in the credit for the stand. The walking dude is a dark lord, but he's bloody personality. Other oh, yeah. than just being evil. Yeah. Like Voldemort's evil as a trait, I'm fine with. Evil as a personality is not a personality. Yeah. I mean, I, and, you know, uh, Kenneth comes to mind from Live Ship. Uh, yeah. And also, remember how you said you think Euron could be the best antagonist in the genre? I'll take Kenneth. Yeah. I mean, Kenneth's definitely up there. There's no doubt. Regal is very mustache trolling in a sense yeah. and, and Farseer. And I, I liked it. Like, I was, like, so happy to just be, like, unequivocally, like, I hate this person. <laughs> uh, sometimes yeah. it could be a lot of fun. Uh, lo love Triangle, absolutely, by far, even more so than Reluctant Oh, Hero. yeah, that's another if, one I if know. If this is a trope, Love Triangle is the quickest way for me to check out, and I can feel it happening in Rainwilds. It, it's it's happening in Rainwilds. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. Yeah, like, I'll be honest um a love triangle can get me to dnf a book like that's how much i dislike it uh but if there's anyone who could pull it off it'd be robin hobb yeah it, she doesn't though sorry in rain wilds at least that's, that's it's it's by far my least favorite part of the series um but yeah, yeah. that that's upsetting to hear because i'm just starting to uh to kind of get into the rain like i'm starting to appreciate it a little bit and if yeah we're i like all the other i like the other point of views but that point of view is and I already know who it is, uh, which bums me out because I hate that person. I think if it starts with a T. Yeah. Yeah. I can't stand that point of view. Yeah. Worst uh, top character. Anyway. Yeah. Greenbone sack is something I got to get to for sure. I, I, I don't know anybody that loves love triangles. Like I really don't like no all saying she hates them. I don't know a single person's like, oh, man, give me a love triangle. Every book. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see. Mm. Related to what you said earlier, Lord of the Rings doesn't have good villains, but that doesn't drag it down because it's a small part of the story. I think it's like there's an overwhelming amount of evil. Like Sauron is like omniscient almost or omnipotent. Which one is? Uh... I mean, I don't think he's either, but omniscient is all knowing. Omnipotent is all powerful. Damn it. What's the other one? It's omnipresent. No om- omnipresent. Oh, it's so easy to. Oh, gosh. My I don't think teacher. he's that either, though. My Sunday school. Well, not omnipresent, but like he can see you like there's like that, you know, the man's watching you type oh, of yeah. feeling. So I feel like that tension replaces a lot of the things that you would expect to get from an antagonist character that's like on page talking all the time. Um, you know, it's like not wanting to be seen by the eye of Sauron. Where's the eye pointing and that kind of thing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Anyway. Yeah. I can't think of a single love triangle that I like at least off the top of my head. No. No. Can't stand I tried because I saw my, that coming before. My students love love triangles. Oh, well, I'd highly recommend your students read The Rain Wild Chronicles by Robin Hobb. But don't skip the stuff before it. This is yeah. my trick to get everyone to read Hobb. I mean, if it was at least done differently than what it always it's always the bad boy and good boy or like you know what i mean like uh or miscommunication oh god yeah i, I can't i'm not gonna lie i don't hate love trial no disclaimer you've been on my good side all night don't don't turn bad on me here don't turn bad on me friend <laughs> i'm not gonna blame someone for not <laughs> no i'm only friend. kidding i'm yeah. only kidding um he didn't give a disclaimer though so <laughs> <laughs> has no disclaimer done the no disclaimers tag i don't know yeah, it's a good a good question. Uh, I was gonna say love triangle scream YA. I don't really. Yeah, I, I I I don't read YA. Well, Rain Wilds might be YA. Like it's on the borderline for me. Like I would say it's as YA as Robin Hobbs ever been so far. So yeah, yeah. Disappointed to hear that there's gonna. God, I I can also tell you something that almost makes up for that, and that is that we get POVs from a certain live ship character. Okay, I'm in. In the last two books, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, I'm in. I I've, I know that the last few books are going to redeem it. It's just book one of the Rainwall Chronicles is extraordinarily rough for Hob. I mean, it's really rough. Yeah, it's just I kept kind of waiting for it to get good, and then I was still waiting <laughs> by the time I got to book two. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I felt. And book two has had a lot of redemption for me. Like I've actually been really into some of the st- some of the POVs. But you know, when you end Fool's Fate, I mean, Fool's Fate's literally like one of the best books I've ever read. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty tough to beat. So. <laughs> sometimes you love someone who loves someone else i mean i'm not disagreeing but it always happens in the same exact formula you know what i'm saying like why can't it just be like really messed up you know Wait, you uh, want your love try okay like i would rather be like i i, yeah, I can't even think of a way so maybe there is no way maybe you i'm know, wrong. Maybe the funny just- thing is the mad ship had a mini love triangle type thing you know yeah etta and no with um althea yeah, that's true. That's, that's true. actually that's probably why it's my least favorite of the three, dude. But I actually remember that. And I said, oh, she kind of like backed out of that. And I thought she did a really good job of like how it realistically happens. And I was like, this is really good. Um, it was it was the bad boy and the, the good boy. It was. Yeah, and then but she started she, out. She backed out. It just ended early. It was just quick. Thank God. Yeah, it didn't uh, need to stay. Hey, Chase, how you doing? We're doing well. We are. We're, we're going. We're going strong. Two hours and 12 minutes in. So here's the question. I pitched Dresden to you. Um, I guess actually I'm going to read all the series that you like. And I, <laughs> what's I, I'm all, like, I was going to say, I'm going to read memories or Thorn thorn though. Yeah. I think so. If you're telling me like what I would like, like put at the top of your queue, I yeah. would say memory, sorrow and thorn. But I say that for a lot of people because I feel like memory, sorrow and thorn is like really important. Like it, it might come out not being your favorite, but when you read it, especially with how much you've read, you're going to be like, Oh, I see, like I see why he's uh, you know always revered by other authors. Like Patrick uh, Rothfuss talks about everybody. George, everybody talks about how important yeah. Pat Williams is, except the readers, <laughs> and it, it kind of bothers me a little uh, a little bit. Yeah. He's kind of an author's author. Yes, and. I've only read two stories, we'll say, from Tad. I read the trilogy of Memory Song Thorn, and I read um, the standalone The War of the Flowers, which I loved. It was a urban portal fantasy. Yeah, I saw your thing, review. Right? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And now I've seen, and I'm not a fan of portal fan. I shouldn't say I'm not a fan. I didn't think I was a fan of portal fantasy until I read that. And it just dropped out all my expectations on its head. And it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I trust Tad Williams is going to tell me a really good story, no matter what it is. 
Uh, is it always going to be the most fast paced thing? No. Do I trust him to get me there and act? And like, I think his plotting is really good. Like, it's the it's like plotting to where I feel it's co not complicated enough, but it has enough nuances that it's like really interesting to read. Um, whereas like some people read Far Seer and don't think the plot is super interesting, right? I do, but mo some people don't. I think Tad brings it on all levels. Like, oh, that's good. I mean, Tad could easily be the best author I've ever read. Like, he could. It's kind of funny that you read like Hob right after. Oh, dude. It, I'm sure I, there would have been like three months of just straight like Williams praise if you hadn't then immediately started Hob. Well, you know, Scott, Scott's an Alex's server. And me and Scott, I think our taste buds for uh, literature are like identical. And yeah. he's like, you know, oh, I've heard Tad's really good, but I love Hob. You're going to love Hob. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if I could love her more than Tad. And now I, I'm pretty sure. I think that the thing about Hob is, is she's not overly complicated with her prose, but she emotionally connects with me. Every time. I mean, she she can just play with me with the sentence and it doesn't have to be overly descriptive or any of that stuff. Uh, the thing I like about Tad is, is that he is flowery and also he's he knows when to be blunt. And when he is, it's very effective. So, OK, they're two. They're two masters. I mean, if I had to pick between them, I'd probably pick Hob, but it's close. It's really close. Yeah, I'm looking forward to um, Memory Shorthorn. That's definitely on my list. See, so, yeah. um, enjoy your reading, Alan. It was nice having you. <laughs> Tad is awesome. Uh, here we go. Jake, where does Malazan rank in your top fan series? Yeah, I'm actually kind of curious about this, too, because I've watched your no spoiler reviews. I think almost all of them. And it's interesting. Like, you're one of the few people I know that has stuck through all 10 books, but I don't feel like you mention it a lot. Oh, I, I mean, I I don't know why I haven't mentioned more. It's just something you haven't read. Um, it's definitely going to be in my top 10. It's kind of hard to place. I feel like compared to the other books on my top 10, it hits higher highs and lower lows. Mm -hmm. um where like we don't get to a book i like more than any malazan malazan book until like three or four but there's also it has some books i'm kind of iffy on mm -hmm. um compared to something like the first law trilogy where i love all three in the first law trilogy yeah. but also if you look at how many books i like in malazan more than all three first law books there's quite a few um yeah. it'd be there'd be four i think um yeah. so it's probably it's definitely probably in the like four to seven range. It's the hardest one to place on my top 10. I love Malazan though. It's not like my favorite series ever. Um, but it's, I think it's fantastic um, in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think, I think that's in just interesting. Uh, and I wonder if it's, it, do you feel like it's more of a personal taste type? Like, you know, like you said, like a song of ice fire, you recognize that it's great. You enjoy it. I think, but it's not yeah. stylistically your favorite. Yeah, I think Malazan is similar in that it's okay. not quite sty a perfect stylistic fit. Um, Mal Malazan, there's definitely less general consensus on what the best books are um, than mm -hmm. almost any other series where it's just some series work for others better. So, for example, in the chat, we got Benjamin Kahn, who usually, like, it's eerie how much our book opinions align. <laughs> um, but we're exactly reversed on Dust of Dreams and Pull the Hounds. Um, I think I remember he was, I think you were pretty lukewarm on Toll the Hounds, right? Benjamin, I forget. I'm pretty sure he was. Well, it's my favorite. And Dust of Dreams is easily my least favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and he's obviously enjoying it quite a bit. So, so don't give me any spoilers. And nobody in the chat, don't, no spoilers. Did Mal, did you feel like Malazan wrapped up properly? Like yeah, the ending ending's great. It's good. Okay, that's awesome yeah. to hear. That's I've awesome. very, very, very rarely see... Um, bad things about the ending cool. um and there's a reason for that the ending is great cool that's awesome uh andrew's wizardly reese's bobby dollar's garbage i've actually heard that i've heard that, that that's unanimously considered tad's worst work uh like some people are like yeah just ignore it uh War member love the dragon bone chair i did too some people say it's slow i didn't i loved it i had no problems with it other land is fantastic that's the next tad series i'm going to be reading since uh the sequel Ostenar trilogy has been delayed uh and there's like a, two, a new novella and then there's another novella or a novel i'm sorry like a stand two standalones in the Ostenard world that i need to read and then also get to the other trilogy but i think i'm going to do other land first because i've heard it's wacky oh that's another thing about tad uh jake is tad is not afraid to get weird okay like he he'll go to like weird places and just say crazy stuff. And he always ends up making it work. And I, I, I love that. I think that's true of Erickson as well. Yeah. Um, Erickson can put some pretty 
crazy stuff on the page. <laughs> I mean, I enjoy um, that. That's the thing I like about Stephen King and Dark Tower. I'm just constantly being, but my mind's being blown, and I'm just like, what is he doing? And it works, and I'm just like, okay, I guess he's that good. He can just make that kind of stuff work. So, um, yeah, I've asked. heard Dark Tower is pretty wild. Yeah, it's by far the weirdest thing I've ever read. It's not even close. Yeah. Right. Not even close. Um, Benjamin asked if I was reading it. It's going to be Otherland. Otherland will probably happen next year. Um, I'm trying to like, I could just keep reading only Tad and Robin Hobb all the time, but I do want to like kind of read other people. Like, it's really hard for me not to just read all Tad, <laughs> Tad Williams' work, to be honest, because he's absurdly good at writing fantasy, but uh, in Otherland sci fi. But I am trying to mix it up a little bit. But I hope I get it. I think it. if I hadn't just binged Malazan, I probably would have also binged the rest of Rama the Elderlings, but. Um, two more than 10 book long series full of big books back to back was just too much for me. Um, yeah, that's yeah. cool that there's a lot to, to go back to. Um, no, well, that is his sci fi series, yes. Uh, Other Land is, and it's pretty highly regarded. Um, Memories Vice almost killed the series for it. Interesting. I, I've heard so many people tell me that I have to read to Memories of Ice, and that's yeah. whenever I can get it. Memories up. of Ice is funny because it seems like non Malazan fans all think it's the consensus favorite Malazan book. And I think on average, it's a well-liked Malazan book. And I really like memories of ice, but I rarely see it as people's top one Malazan book. Um, Interesting. I kind of, before I read the series, I thought it was the most common pick for favorite. Yeah. But, I mean, everyone says do not quit until you finish memories of ice. And I think it's more that like gardens of the moon, dead house gates and memories of ice are all somewhat different in how they're delivered. And it's kind of, they're the three flavors of Malazan. Um, Alan is wrong, by the way. The consensus favorite is not Toll the Hounds. That is one of the more divisive ones. I think the two I see at the top the most often is probably the Bone Hunters, the Crippled God, and maybe Midnight Tides. Well, anytime a last book of a series is being mentioned, that gets me kind of elated because it's an, an ending doesn't have to be the best part of a book for me to love it. Uh, clearly, because I like books that aren't finished. <laughs> uh, but it, it it's nice to see that. You know what I'm saying? So, Alan, you just ta are talking to the wrong people then, um, because there's a lot of people who have told the hounds like middle of the pack to low on their rankings. M m you'll never see Toll the Hounds as someone's like third to fifth favorite Malazan book. It's either top two or like bottom three or four. It's never in the middle. I'm so I'm going to be getting in, uh, into Malaz in uh, November or December. It's been pushed back a lot because I got other stuff I got to read. But yeah, um, the Andrews that he scored uh, other land hardcover first edition first two signs scored. That is awesome. That's awesome. Malaz is absolutely fantastic. Almost done with House of Chains. It's eerily close to eclipsing a song of ice and fire. And I'm nervous. Wow. Wow. And it's weird. I've heard a lot of a Song of Ice and Fire fans say that. I've I've heard a lot of them. Like, you know, I thought I was, you know, I read all the other stuff that people tell me to, and then Malazan was able to to do seems something. Like, seems like there's quite a bit of overlap between the two. Um, Rome of the Elderlings, I think, has Same. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, the, those two are neck and neck for me. Uh, I picked up Shadow Arch from the local used bookstore, and I just started it. Cool. Let me know how you like it, Derek. I, I'm very interested in that. Um, I would even maybe consider putting it above Otherland if I heard enough good stuff about it. Um, but <laughs> Dark Tower is a weird series. It sure as hell is. It sure. All I'm saying is on the, and this isn't a spoiler because you can look on the front cover. Wolves of Kala has robotic horses with werewolves riding them with lightsabers. The Wolves of Kala cover is so wild, man. Like I saw, I was just like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> yeah, it's insane. Um, let's see. Uh, is a slog fest for me. Yes, yeah, so, I, I like the Malazan. I like that it is such a very like kind of how you said uh, nobody can agree on what's the best or like top five, right? Like everyone has like, oh, yeah. a very different list. And I think that's a, a very good thing. Yeah. And I mean, it's the same for a lot of series. I think, um, I think that's true for stormlight at this point. There's very little consensus that I see. Um, I see oh, all I just, four Stormlight books at People's One all the time. I mean, I do, but I think Words of Radiance is overwhelming. Yeah, and that's my and that's the most common. And I thought that was the more common pick for one, but like it on average probably is the pick for one. But still, a huge amount of people. Yeah, but Oathbringer or Rhythm of War or Way of Kings at one. And um, when that and when that series is done, there will be a huge variance. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, and I think I mean it's probably true for. 
realm of the elderlings as well although i think it's more concentrated to there are people who like live ship the most tawny man the most and fits in the fool i very very rarely see people say yeah farseer is the best realm of the elderlings or rain wilds is the best realm of the elderlings not never but way less common than any of the other three trilogies yeah um i i like this comment from head cannon here it says i love when massive series have natural stopping points mini series realm of the elderlings first law if wheel of time had that i'd be like uh, inclined to start i think it's good to have both but i'm with you in the fact that i i kind of like being able to stop and say okay i'm gonna put this down for a little bit and go do something else and it'll be here when i get back the one thing i will say um it sucks whenever the stopping point happens and then you have a start point and then the next starting point isn't as hype and i'm specifically talking about rainwild chronicles <laughs> because yeah. you're like i gotta get through this to get to my next starting point which is with the characters i've been missing um with that said it's not like torture um joe abercrombie has subtly built like one of the best fantasy worlds and series in my opinion uh in the last few years Oh, yeah, uh, I, that reminds me of something I wanted to talk about that right, I've seen you mention. Um, you mentioned a lot, and I totally agree that the way Abercrombie has had technology subtly evolve throughout the first law yeah. is rather unique in fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I actually think Stormlight does that as well. It's just the technology is totally different than our technological Well, let's evolution. go there. Yeah, let's go there, actually. Um, because I'm hearing from, from sources... Sources have told me, coming across my desk right now, <laughs> that Stormlight is going to end up in space? Yeah, so for the final, yes, basically. Mm. there. Um, Brandon read a uh, excerpt from a novella. I don't know if you've read Sixth of Dust. Probably not. Sixth of Dust 2 is the farthest forward thing chronologically in the Cosmere, and both Scadriel and Roshar are spacefaring. And it's kind of, so basically Scadriel is mimics uh, the technological evolution of Earth and Roshar will be at a similar level of technology, but it'll be like they go a totally different path because they go the the Stormlight route and not the industrial route. I, I'm not going to lie to you. We'll see what happens. If Stormlight goes from its setting to like, Kaladin's on the moon. So just to be clear, <laughs> I, just gonna, to be I'm clear, gonna... just to be clear, when they say Stormlight is in space, that means there will be spacefaring Rasharans, not in the ten books of the Stormlight Archive. They will go to space. Oh, okay. It, yeah. I, so I, I had heard that like by book ten, we would be in space. I guess we could, but I mean, no one has confirmed that. I think. I I'd mean, there's out. there's no I'd proof that it hasn't. But I, the only person who could give you a definitive answer on that would be Brandon Sanderson if he chose to. Um, I think it's highly unlikely considering the way the timelines work. Um, so the final thing in the Cosmere is going to be Space Mistborn. Like that's the final trilogy. Huh. Um, and that's going to chronologically happen many hundreds of years after Stormlight. So maybe may, I might have my wires crossed. I might have my wires crossed. And maybe I'm thinking Mistborn then. Yeah, because Space Cause I, Mistborn. I just remember hearing thing. it and being like, ah, uh, it's like, you know, when they sent Jason to space, <laughs> like yeah. in, in the Friday the 13th franchise. And it was like, I guess I guess yeah, that's, it's more it's Roshar, like the Space Mistborn. It's not going to be like Avengers Assemble. It's going to be like Roshar is a factor. OK, Um, we'll see. Anyway, but we'll it's very, very unlikely that like Stormlight 10 is going to happen in space. Oh, people are popping. Uh, no, Jason X was hilarious. Don't get me wrong. Uh, whenever he takes the two women in sleeping bags and he's like clubbing them off of, of a tree, it's ridiculous. However, you can't, I don't think it was the best thing for the franchise. <laughs> and uh, I will say, I think I get a little worried um, about that uh, with, with, yeah. the cosmere but we'll see we'll as see. far as i know there aren't any series that are fantasy and sci-fi but the cosmere in general will be fantasy and sci-fi yeah and that's um, fine i mean if anyone where it's kind of you know hey you said for the first law you think it's cool to go through technology how about going from you know mm -hmm. literally early fantasy all the way through for an entire like you know yeah so the reason why I find the technological advancements uh, in First Law without giving away any spoilers for two reasons. One, thematically, it's amazing because exploring the fact that whenever these advancements happen, it's always the people who are the poorest that end up getting taken advantage of. 
And I think that that's like a really good theme. Uh, the other thing about it is I like the fact that magic isn't economically viable. So it's being sacrificed for like coal. Like, I just think that's so, that's so funny. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I could use fireballs, but why would I do that when I can burn coal? That being said, magic is also getting weaker. Yes. But. Yes. But the, I mean, part of the reason is no one, well, we, we can't get into spoilers, but yeah, but I think it's very much tied to the fact that it's not economically viable. And it's easier yeah. to control people with money than it is with magic uh, and, and brute force in your face force, right? It's easier to work in the shadows and siphon money and keep the poor poor. I think that's kind of the idea. Of the yeah, and I mean, I think in the Cosmere, it's going a different path, but it's more like, you know, there's still going to, the people in charge aren't going to use magic in the economy. Like, it's just, it's another resource they can use. They're not going to let it sit around. Yeah. Um, especially when, you know, you have magic that's more, the magic's a lot more reliable in the Cosmere. And I think yeah, if magic sure. was reliable in the first law, then they would continue to use magic like that. Well, the, I mean, also, we're very much comparing apples to oranges, right? Like, yeah, um, magic plays a very different role in these in these two worlds. So, I mean, you, you have Way a different. Point. Yeah, you have a good point. Uh, Alan asked, uh, do you like when people stand around staring at Black Lady for 100 pages at a time while picking lint from the belly buttons? I, I actually do. So I guess I'll love to hold that. <laughs> My mom says, good night. Good night, mom. I for the record, you. I uh, I have questions about the validity of that question and how well it determines how much you'll enjoy Dole Hounds. <laughs> um, Got to catch up on all these. Okay, at Derek Allen. Uh, nice. I read the Shadow March series a few years ago. I enjoyed it a lot. I remember Star Thor a couple years ago. It's now one of my favorite fantasy series. Very cool. Uh, fantasy Bobble says, Shadow March is great. Favorite side character from Tad, but the protagonists were not the best. Interesting. Um, Andrews Wizardly said, I'm an odd, but I love Oathbringer. Oathbringer was my favorite until I sat on it for a while um and now it's not but i i think that's a fair i, I i'd say oathbringer is the most polarizing book uh out of the stormlight arc yeah i mean either oathbringer or rhythm of war i don't know which the next two the the most recent two seem to be more pol polarizing than the first two i'd agree uh, i've got way of kings overwards radiance honestly i've been kind of thinking about that a lot lately um it'll take a reread for me to decide um, I think about that every time I read Way of Kings and then I read Words of Radiance and I decide I liked Words of Radiance more. So in interesting that big Sanderson fans seem to love Rhythm of War, but many casual fans seem to dislike it. Or is it just hip nowadays, bash the popular guy? Well, eh, I, I don't mean, think it's because hip. Um, I think it's because of aspects of the book. I think um, many people... Very real criticisms. Yeah, like many people will disagree whether... Some people think Rhythm of War is the best Brandon book. Many people do not. But Rhythm of War is the most Brandon book. If you take all the things that Brandon does um, that are kind of regularly, they're kind of pumped to 11 in Rhythm of War, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, the more science-y magic systems, um, exploration of like mental illness stuff, like all the Sanderson stuff just goes more in Rhythm of War. So people who like not just Sanderson's story, but his style of stories seem to like it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who are kind of not huge on like his style of storytelling, but are just like, all right, it's just a really good story. Seem to not like as much. That's my theory behind it either way. I don't think it's just people bashing him because it's popular. I mean, does that happen? Yeah. There's five people who gave it Probably. one star before it came out, but like it, we, we can't pay attention to those people. But as someone who did not love Rhythm of War, uh, I think there's like real criticisms with that book. And again, the formula of Stormlight is going to lend itself to books being very polarizing going forward. Um, especially when we get into the extended cast of characters. Um, with that said, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'm a casual Brandon Sanderson fan. Maybe I am. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think casuals the right word, but as in like, well, no, no. I mean, I, I think that like it might be a fair word because like you're, you're pretty into the Cosmere, right? You've yeah. read almost all of it. Okay. So like, uh, yeah, not white sand, but everything else. <clears throat> so I, I've read Mistborn era one and Warbreaker, uh, emperor soul and all the stormlight books and novellas. So I've read a decent amount, I guess. And I like crazy, but it's the same thing with a song of ice and fire. Like I can tell you how amazing I think books four and five are because of how it ties into yada, yada, yada. Some people don't care. Um, they, they don't care about that stuff. And, and I, even though I'm going to read all of the Cosmere, I don't necessarily care about all the crossovers. Like if, if, if we're redeeming people casuals because they're only reading stormlight, then yes, they're probably going to enjoy the things that make 
the diehards love the book less, right? Like they don't care if such and such shows up from Mistborn in book five or book six. Uh, and that's fine. I think a series has to stand on its own. And I think Stormlight does, to be clear. But I think that people will get a more of an enjoyment out of it if they are diehard fans, meaning that they care about the Cosmere. Right? Yeah, I think it has less, less mass appeal. Um, yeah, I hope that made thing. sense. I hope that I made sense it. to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's kind of, I mean, I think something somewhat similar happened with like a dance with dragons. I think if you look at a dance with dragons, like average ranking of people, if they have a song of ice and fire as one of their like top three series ever, a dance with dragons is probably very regularly people's second or third favorite. Yeah. And then if you look at people who are kind of like a song of ice and fire, but lo don't love it like me, it's normally closer to the bottom. Yeah. And then if you have people who kind of think a song of ice and fire is okay, it's usually last or yeah, well, yeah I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. I think it's very the mo very popular opinion, or, or in this case, we call it a casual opinion. But I, I don't, I don't know if I'd classify it with that with George's writings. But a lot of people say one through three, best some of the best fantasy all time. Four and five, I could do without. But I'm die hard. I'm super yeah. into it, so I love four and five. I actually it's, love five yeah. a lot. I think it's his best writing. But um, and also casual might have to do with just like even if you really enjoy it, if the way you read a book is the new book comes out, you read it wait three years, new book comes out, you read it, wait three years, new book comes out, you read it. Even if you really liked it, you would be like a casual fan compared to someone like me who rereads it constantly. I'll mm -hmm. open the copper mind and look at stuff. Like I'm going to guess you haven't ever accidentally stayed up late, constantly clicking on copper mind links and uh, going down the rabbit hole. A little bit, a little bit in way of Kings and words of radiance. Um, and then a lot of the stuff started getting fleshed out and oh, okay. I'm definitely one that loves the mystery. Um, and as mysteries get more and more unfolded, sometimes it hits, sometimes it misses. And that's just part of expectations, I guess. Uh, it's not necessarily the author's fault or anything like that. So, um, but I do think that like, there's a lot of Cosmere fans that look at it and say, well, how can you not love this? It ties into this, this, and this. And the person just stares at me like, I don't care. Like, I, I, I just want to read this book. Yeah. And I think that both are right. Um, I don't think necessarily one is, is correct. So, um, unpopular opinion. I hated the last 20%. I don't think that's an unpopular opinion. I think a lot of people hate uh, the last argument of King's uh, ending. Is that an unpopular? Is that? Unpopular um, it's. I liked it, but yeah. So I would say the vast majority of people like it, but it's not like you're there. It's not like there's only a, still quite a few people didn't like the last 20% of last argument of King's. I think there's very few people who would say it's a bad execution of what it was trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people don't like what it was trying to do. Yeah, I think I think that that you hit the nail. That's perfect, Jake. That's exactly right. Um, Christian loves First Law. Like I, uh, Jabber Crombie is now his favorite author over Brandon Sanderson. Uh, I think I can say that. Uh, maybe he wanted to say it, <laughs> but uh, it, I should say there's a good chance that's happening right now as we speak. Um, but he didn't really love uh, some of the ending of Last Argument of Kings. That's like what I'm saying. Like I know people who love series that didn't like the ending. Um, so I just didn't think. I thought that was a pretty like polarizing book even i guess um like i said i i liked it i thought it was good i didn't hate it didn't necessarily love love it but um yeah it's interesting uh where's christian when you knew i know i don't know where my aussie friend is i don't know this born is going to space now we're it kinda, is, yeah i'm like kind of catching up cowhood and on the moon is hilarious jason x is hilarious um noel is also skeptical about um moon Mistborn, is what i'm now naming it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess i don't know we know who the protagonist is going to be of it if you want i can tell you it's a character we know it's all i don't want to spoil yeah don't, don't. You, you can discord. tell me you can tell me after uh after this yeah, i just dm <laughs> you on discord if i see kaladin on the moon i'm gonna be depressed <laughs> holy crap he came here when his name was mentioned look at the most recent comment <laughs> all right i'm kind of uh we, I'm just going to put some of these up. Uh, I think. Yeah, so. it's from Space. Lost in Discovery. A wild Christian appears. Oh, Did, my. Do you does goodness. he straight up have like a Dresden summoning type thing going on? Like Dresden, it's like if you say there's like immortal beings and you can summon them by saying their name three times. If you do it wrong or they'll probably be rather upset with you. But is that what happens with Christian? Like you say his name three times and he gets like a ping and is like people are talking about me in a. <laughs> it's a wild christian appears I, my friend i've been i've been literally ringing the bell wondering where you are I, is it true that i see i thought it that 
um, Stormlight was going to end up in space, but now I'm hearing I'm wrong and it's actually Mistborn. Did I did I mishear you in one of your videos? I probably did, but he can confirm this. Also, Christian, who do you like more as an author, Joe Abercrombie or Brandon Sanderson? If somebody says Coppermine, I show <laughs> Okay, so it's copper mine. So it was actually me that summoned him, not a uh, yes, not Jimmy. As we wait on that, uh, Mike, uh, I don't know how to say this name. Uh, Two thousand. <laughs> this is best serve cold. Talk of that best of the standalones. Uh, so I like best serve cold. I know Christian and chat love best serve cold. Uh, <clears throat> there's somebody here that didn't finish it, but read Wizard's first rule to completion. <laughs> okay, that's not a fair comparison. It is such a fair comparison. No, I listened to Wizard's first rule on audio over four and a half months. <laughs> um, okay, uh, best serve cold. I was reading as the main book that I wanted. Also. The, the fact that I know I love most of Abercrombie's books makes it hurt more. I like Best Serve Cold way more than Wizard's First Rule, for the record. Anyways, um, I have good news for you if you want to see me and Jimmy talk about Best Serve Cold. Yeah. Because if you go to the Bookborn YouTube channel, there is like an hour-long discussion that yeah. has me and Jimmy about Best Serve Cold. And we go at um, it a little bit. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not a fan of Best Serve Cold. It's easily my least favorite Abercrombie book. Um, but it's much better than Wizard's First Rule, in my opinion. Um, I've read Wizard's First Rule three times. <laughs> oh, yes, go check out that Bookborn channel after this stream, of course. Uh, and like like uh, Jake said, it, it was a wonderful talk uh, between Bookborn, uh, Liana, and myself uh, with Jake, and uh, a lot of different opinions, a lot of different favorite scenes, and I actually I I really enjoyed that discussion. I thought it was really fair. So. Yeah, we didn't fight as much as I think the audience wanted us to. But anyway, I've been to, I got to see that debate. Um, you know, we keep it pretty amicable, but I, I take some pop shots at Jake because, uh, you know, I got to, you know, it's 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 what I do. Uh, here we go. Lost this guy. This is fresh off the press, folks. Mistborn is confirmed. Yeah. Uh, Stormlight Archive. We're not sure of yet. I suspect we'll get there. And yeah, I much well, prefer Joe's writing to Sandra. Basically, and I don't know if he was here, but what I said is I suspect. I mean, I this is confirmed. We'll see Rashar in space. I don't think we'll see space in the events of Stormlight just because it would mean Stormlight would have to be get in space so much earlier than Scadrial that it seems hard for the timelines to work because Space Mistborn is so many hundreds of years after Stormlight 10. Uh, and Christian, feel free. Um... But we're me and Christian are both like the ultimate Cosmere nerds. We could do this too long. We're like, we talk about Cosmere timelines because we both... Christian, oh Christian do you want to link? Do you want to jump in here? <laughs> yeah, sure. Because I, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about that. I don't know. He he might not be able to, but we'll, we'll see what he says in chat. Um, uh, he agrees with it. He said, yeah, that's a good point, Jake. And when, when Lost in Discovery is giving you Cosmere credit, you got to take it. I mean, I, I think I've read Stormlight more than he has. Oh, uh, God damn. I've read uh, Wave Kings and Words of Radiance seven times each, Jesus. Oathbringer four times, and Rhythm of War once. Because each time I read them, they get even better. Really? Yeah. Uh, mate, I would. I'd be packing up my car to head off for the weekend. Well, yeah. I, I kind of want to ask you this, Christian, because I feel like the one thing I really like about Christian, Christian is a massive Brandon Sanderson fan. And I, and I obviously have things I love from Brandon and things that I don't. I'm always able to talk about... Uh, my opinions with Christian, even when we disagree and we have like really good dialogue, same thing with you, Jake. Like, I feel like I can talk, like we talk about stuff we don't agree on. And yeah. It's, right. Yeah. You trash wall of Ascension. I die a little on the inside. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's I all may or, or may not have sent a glowing bald assassin after you for that. Whatever you got delayed by shit. Uh, it's going to take a while to get there. I mean, it's, 10 it's to 15 what... business days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Christian, I'm kind of curious to your opinion and Jake as well. Like, would you guys be okay with going to space if it happened in Stormlight? I'm not saying um, it's going to. I'm just saying if it did, let's just let's if it start. did. Yeah, I I probably I wouldn't be the most enthusiastic about it, but also at this point, I trust Brandon enough that I think the book where the, I think I would be less excited about it going into the book, but then the book would probably change my mind. And I'd be like, yeah, I had to do that. That's yeah. what I think would probably happen. Yeah. One thing I can confidently say is Brandon Sanderson is a master of plots. Uh, yeah. Like I think a main plots. I want to be very specific on that. Uh, But if anyone could do it, it would be him. 
that that could make it work. But my gut reaction of Kaladin in the moon suit, uh, bouncing in between like craters on the moon, not a fan. Not a fan. <laughs> yeah, uh, my instinct is no, but I think. I mean, I also like if you told me actually, I knew in words of Ra- when I was reading Words of Radiance who the book four flashbacks were going to be, I and like that it would focus on that race. I would have been like, eh. But then he wrote it, and I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I didn't love the flashbacks, but in general, Sanderson changes my mind when I think he's going in the wrong direction. So it's mm-hmm. probably what would happen. But I would probably like if you told me now, what would you rather? I would rather um, they stay on Roshar or only travel through Cosmere magic memes, not spaceships. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, what lost Scary said, I pretty much agree with Jake. I'm more keen on as a concept that continues after 10 books. Yeah. And I think that would be really cool. Uh, yeah. Even, that's what... it still might not be my thing. If yeah. I'm I mean, it's going to, they're, they're going to end up in space eventually. That's yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, and I... I'm assuming Lost and Discovery's read six of us too. But... Now, I'll tell you what. Let me tell you this. Um, Chris Bookish Cauldron absolutely hates <laughs> the Cosmere. He hates Brandon Sanderson, right? Uh, he loves love skyward says he prefers brandon sci-fi writing so my interesting thing is like maybe like era four mistborns is going to be nutty like maybe it's going to be awesome i mean i think it's gonna be pretty awesome well yeah i mean I, but i'm saying like even even more so you know what i mean like like yeah. I know a lot of people are not a big fan of air two mistborn right um, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, so I just, I, you know, it's kind of exciting is, is what I'm getting at. If it is with Miss Bourne, obviously Miss Bourne's going to space, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Era 2 is also going to be, in terms of, like, the characters that are involved, it's probably the the odd one out compared to the other three trilogies in terms of, like, what's connected. And yes, no disclaimer, you're right. The Well of Ascension ending is mind-blowingly fantastic. Don't yeah, let Jimmy tell you good. otherwise. Oh, even no. Jimmy says. Okay, fantastic. No, dude, stuff. dude, Sanderson endings... Uh, to, I mean, 90% of the time are amazing. I know. Well, of Ascension has an amazing ending, but uh, I just didn't like anything else in the book. I literally didn't like a single thing other than that. Um, yeah. So, and then that put me in a weird space for book three. Yeah. Like, this put me in a weird space for book three. Book one of Mistborn is really good. It's really, really good. The writing's not great, but the story is pretty goddamn great. Um, Zane was a boo boo, though. You damn that right. That is true. Yeah. You damn right. <laughs> Huge Cosmere fan. Zane. And he's probably like, you know, he can be the, you know, Hob gets a mulligan with Timara. Brandon gets a mulligan with Zane. Everyone gets a mulligan. Fair enough. Fair enough. Hot take, Calden wants. No, I don't think that's, that's a hot a, take, Worm. I think uh, everybody thinks Kaladin's dead. Um, I don't want to talk about what I think is going to happen to Kaladin. Rhythm of War changed my mind on where I think Kaladin is ending. Um, although just based on timeline, I guess Kaladin won't survive to see space. But that's because I think they won't go to space for like 400 years or something. But so I guess old age, but um, I've changed my mind where I think Kaladin's going to go, but obviously I'm not going to talk about that because spoilers. There'll be radiation poisoning probably from the trip there. If I had to guess. Uh, yeah. If Kaladin's in a moon suit, I'm out. <laughs> Dude, I kind of want to start this narrative that he's going to be in a moon suit and like get memes going. <laughs> and where Brandon has to address it on one of his live streams. <laughs> yeah. He'll probably be like you people. Yeah. I hate I, this fantasy network guy sucks. Um, if he likes Skyward, he'd probably like Garen Lagan. I don't know. Uh, very sort of upset. Cool. Apparently, the audiobook for Skyward is phenomenal. Um, do you both audiobook at all? Kramer makes this barn narrative too, so much better than it's in its print. I'm actually probably going to do audio for uh, Miss Born. Lately, I've been really leaning on audio a lot. Um, I, I, I've, I'm having an issue with uh, my eye, my left eye, and to avoid wearing my eyes out and going possibly blind in the near future i have been doing a ton of audio so i uh, i definitely do audiobooks what about you jake i do almost no audio um i think i could i might start doing audio for my rereads for the series i've read a lot that i still do want to keep rereading um but if i'm reading something for audio for the first time my brain wanders off for five minutes and then suddenly someone is dead and i have no idea why and what was that world building where did that come from what is going on what book am i reading mm-hmm um, so I just end up not knowing what's going on as well. Also, I find just for, I don't know why, um, in, except for just audio, the emotional moments don't seem to hit as hard for a lot of people. It's the opposite. I don't know why, even for really good narrators. Hmm. Um, so it's actually funny cause I'm kind of the, I used my audible free trial, um, 
to get changes by Jim Butcher so I could listen to changes as I read the end of changes because I wanted to hear the performance of James Marsters. Um, which, by the way, I hear only good things about the Dresden audio. Um, I know Scott or Glasgow on yeah. Alex's Discord, his two favorite narrators are Stephen Pacey and James Marsters. And then there's a pretty big it, gap for three. If Scott says it's good. I, I trust it. Yeah, Scott's trustworthy. Um, um, so he says it's great. Anyways, that's really the only, other than that, I don't really do audiobook at all. I wish I could, but my brain won't do it. It's a, absolutely a, an acquired thing. Like uh, I started out listening on one time speed and I was like, I can't concentrate. And then it got to the point where I was like, well, if I want to keep up my, you know, a hundred pages a day, there's going to be days where I got to fit in audio because I just can't be in front of a book. Um, and now I listen on two times speed and drives my wife banana sandwich. <laughs> she hates it. Like she's like, I, I don't even understand. I don't understand how you're even listening to that. I'm like, oh, what? I can hear it. I understand it perfectly. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you talk about emotional moments hitting, I agree. I think most of the times I've had like maybe one or two that have hit okay on audio, but I think that reading it is just better. Um, personally. Yeah. So it's I wouldn't want to ever, if, if I wouldn't want to ever risk not having the emotional impact hit. Cause that's like the main thing I'm going for. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's one of those. I've definitely had moments where I, I uh, some it actually has happened in Dark Tower. A uh, big moment happened, and then I went and got the book, and I reread it, and then I just kept reading the physical. So you're definitely not yeah. wrong on that, especially at two times, because you're not going to get the narrator's pausing and cadence, and that's very important. I know people get really offended when people like listen at fast speeds because it kind of ruins the art of narration, but. Uh, I, you know, time is money, friend. I got, I got to do it on two X. It's just, it's just what I do. Also one slight warning. I've heard only bad things about the Alera audio. Okay, cool. I, Dresden could very well end up being an audio series for me. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I've literally only heard good things about the Dresden audio. I, I, I mean, I'm listening to changes on audio right now and I'm like, all right, even if it's not my thing, I can acknowledge this is a pretty damn good narrator. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm doing Dragon Haven on audio right now, and uh, it's really bad because when Thymera gets mentioned, I just like it's really hard to focus. But for some reason, it's easy to grind those chapters on audio. Like Wheel of Time is not my favorite series, so I prefer it on audio. Uh, it's how I can get through it. I also love Stormlight on audio because Michael Kramer and um, um, uh, Kate Redding are phenomenal. So Malazan is almost impossible to on it. I've heard that. I've heard that. I feel like it's too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I can't do audiobooks. I've but, tried so hard. I just can't. Yeah. Malazan's also one of them where a lot of the time, like someone says something and you just have to kind of stop and think about it to figure out what they were like, the actual like complete meaning of it. And so I feel like audio, I'd constantly be pausing and doing awkward stuff. I, I haven't done Malazan in audio, but I can't imagine it being anything less than terrible. Yeah, this kind of lesser known S tier audiobook narration is the Magician's Trilogy by Lev Grossman. Highly recommend that series for trope busting, plotting, and deep character. Yeah, I'm definitely going to read the Magicians at some point on my TBR as well. Yeah, yeah, I've heard enough about it to at least pique my interest to see what all the fuss is about, and I think I'm going to like it a lot. Um, Jake, to your point about like missing stuff and rewinding, if I have to have hit the back thirty second button more than once, I just stop listening. And I'm like, oh, either okay. either I go to my physical or I just stop. I'm like, okay, I just. Okay, I'm right. going to predict if you started Gardens of the Moon on audio, <laughs> you would make it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you'd make it through the prologue before doing that twice. Chapter one, though, you'd be constantly hitting the back. So, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to get to it. I will say, I think my progress through Malazan is not going to be anywhere near what Realm of the Elderlings was because I listened to a lot of Farsi or, uh, and Tawny Man on audio. Uh, and it helps me get through books a lot faster. Man, I couldn't. I wouldn't want to do live ship or Tawny man on audio because of like, I feel like the, I'd miss out on some of the emotional gut punches and those books have some emotional gut punches. Um, I've also heard that about my number one source for information. When I say anything about an audiobook narrator, I'm just regurgitating what Scott says. Yeah. And yeah. his top three are uh, Stephen Pacey, who does the first law, um, James Marsters, who does Dresden. And I want to say Tim Geralt Reynolds or something who does Red Rising. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good to hear, because if I can do Red Rising on audio, that's going to get me to be able to do um, a lot more <laughs> in a shorter period of time, which would be great. Um, so I might check that out. Actually, I have the first I actually have all three books now. I, I just bought them. Um, so I, I have a very random question, and it's a very specific skill for authors to have. And I'm wondering who you think is who you think is very good at it. OK, it's totally out of nowhere. All right. It's um. Uh, writing like 4,000 year old characters, like extremely old characters. Um, 
Yeah, Robin Hobb. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's Hobb. one that would be up there for me. Um, my actual this this was secretly a way for me to moving into more Jim Butcher pitch because Robin Hobb and Jim Butcher are my two picks for that. All right, um, cool. In general, I think Jim Butcher is. I'm trying to think if I even think any may I, I guess I'll have again. All right. For anything involving character for now on, when I say someone is when I'm thinking of who's better, I'm excluding Hob, just assume she's one. Um, moving on. Um, I think he's so, so good at making people feel the age they actually are. Like there's um there's a relatively prevalent side character in Alara who's like in his 80s and 90s. Mm-hmm. And he really feels like, okay, this guy's lived 90 years. Um, and you know, there are Dresden characters who are 4,000 who actually feel 4,000. Wow. I mean, you're right. That is a very specific skill, but I know what you're talking about because there's certain creatures within the realm of the elderlings that legitimately feel ancient. Yeah. So I I know exactly what you mean. So that's a big, I mean, you've definitely sold me on Jim Butcher. I didn't need a huge push, but I got one. I feel like both me and Alex loving it. Like there's not that many books that me and Alex love and you don't like. Yeah, me and Alex have extraordinarily uh, similar taste. I love Alex, man. I really do. Yeah, Alex I, uh, is great. Yeah, don't Alex let me hear him say that though. <laughs> Alex is a, a cheeky bastard, and I, I love him for it. Um, no disclosure. So Jimmy should react to Gardens of the Moon on audio. I, I actually am very much consi- I've never done a reading vlog. I think I might do it when I do my Lawson because I feel like it's going to be an experience, and I also think it could end up helping me out through the series. I think that would be really cool. I'm very nervous about spoilers. Very nervous because I am a person. If I get spoiled, 99% chance I stop reading. So uh, that's just how I am. So by the way, no disclaimer asked a question um, about how Erickson handles ancient uh, characters. And then Benjamin answered. And I almost completely agree with Benjamin in that. I feel like Erickson probably would be good at it. He just made it too hard for himself in that he made his character so much older than any other fantasy character. Oh, I see. Erickson isn't the best. Um, okay. So Erickson doesn't just have 4,000 year olds. Erickson has 300,000 year olds. And I don't believe they're 300,000. Yeah, I mean, how um, could you? We can't even process it. And I almost, this kind of annoys me a bit um, because Erickson and a bunch of people say how Erickson made such a smart choice of not getting in a 300,000 year old's head. There's a specific 300,000 year old and how that was totally the best decision and how you could never get in a 300,000 year old's head. But he has like 10 other POVs who are 300,000. And I'm yeah. like, does that advice, like, are you admitting you were wrong? Like, yeah. if you're right, then you are basically criticizing your own book 10 times. Like, come That's on. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Uh, yes to the Malaz and vlog. Uh, so how, how, I guess, here's a question. By the for, way, go I'm going to add to that. I will say the one character who he's talking about is like the one character I believe is totally ancient. So I think he's right. Don't get in the 300,000 year old's head. Why did you do it 10 times? None of the characters whose head you get in feel like, because he's when he says why he didn't do it for one character, mm-hmm. he's completely right. And I totally agree with him, which is why I get annoyed when he does it for the other 10. Yeah, that's that's kind of funny. He went against his own word there. Um, I see people talking about top tier audiobook uh, narrators. One person I want to bring up, and he is no longer with us, is and we we're talking about this in Alex's Discord. Is Frank Muller? Frank Muller did the. Uh, he's done a lot, but uh, notoriously did the first four Dark Tower books, and without a doubt, the best audiobooks I've ever listened to, in my opinion. And unfortunately, Frank passed away in a motorcycle accident, tragically, Uh, not instantly. It kind of he was like paralyzed and I think he had brain damage and then he ended up passing away. And it's so crazy because his voices that he narrated the Dark Tower with Stephen King says that those became the real voices he heard when he was writing the future books, which is just tremendous. I mean, that's the highest compliment you can get. Right. Yeah. And now when I read, I hear his voices, but I'm doing it on audio. And uh, I forget the gentleman's name. Uh, I think it's George something. He's he's a very good. He's a very good narrator, but he's just nowhere near. Frank Muller was perfect. I mean, per, uh, Pal Pacey is perfect for First Law. Frank Muller was perfect for um, Dark Tower. And I just always want to put that over, man. His first four books on audio. Some of the, if not the best audio books I've, I've ever Heard. Sorry to hear about Muller, but glad to hear the first four will be great audio. But oh, I mean, they're tremendous. I, I actually think it's like a detriment. Like you should. And it's not that the other guy isn't great. It's just nobody was filling those shoes. 
Imagine if if uh, you know Kate Redding just dropped off Stormlight or Michael yeah. Kramer. Like you would be I, like, I, yeah, I'm adding the the Dresden fans as well because James Marston has been Dresden for 17 books, and yes. it's actually when Ghost Story first came out, which is book 13. Um, he had like a contractual obligation, so they couldn't get James Marsters. And so it's someone different for book 13. And apparently the person is good, but, but it's just like, so many people are just like, who is this person? And then eventually they re-recorded it. So James, there's a James Marsters version. It's, as like well. a, it's like a recast in a TV show or something. Yeah. You know I mean? It's like, you can't like, it doesn't matter how good the person does. They were going to fail. Right. And that's kind of how I felt with the dark tower audio. And it's uh significant. Like I should have been done with it by now, but it significantly slowed me down with books five, six, and seven. As, as soon as someone has a job, in something art related where being different to the previous person is automatically bad. They're screwed. Joker. Batman. Yeah. Movies. Yeah. Jared Leto is never going to get, I mean, some people like him. I get that, but like Heath Ledger owns the Joker role now. Yeah. But I mean, like even, um, you know, hockey walking Phoenix's Joker is pretty well loved, but that's also cause it's just such a different Joker. Yeah. But... We, might, we might be far enough removed. Yeah. Now. Uh, the funny thing is that's happened like three times with the Joker. Like it's apparently true. Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson. people yeah. like that's the Joker. And then Heath Ledger and were, Heath Ledger was the Joker. And now um, well, I, I think what happens with those is people want the character. And I mean, literally the character, the Joker so bad that eventually they have to let go yeah. uh, of that typecast. Now, if you ask anyone who the best Joker was, I think majority would probably say Heath Ledger. Probably the most common pick. I'm sure lots would still pick Nicholson and uh, Walking Phoenix. I yeah. pick Ledger. I, I haven't seen the new Joker because I'm not oh, super interested, but Walking Phoenix is my favorite actor. Um, you should. So it's I, really good. I'm definitely going to at some point. Um, but yeah, my Mark Hamill is the best Joker. Uh, that's funny. Uh, Michael Kramer is great, but still couldn't keep me awake during wheel time. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Oh my God. Savage. So savage. It's harsh. Uh, it sucks because Guard of the Moon is impossible to follow an audio, but the narrator was fantastic. The con yeah, I've heard that. I've heard the narrator is very, very good. Heath is the goat. Yeah, people people really appreciate that. Somehow I ended up being the chatting with nuts character that talked about audio narrators. The actually, I guess I don't think Philip it. Chase. I don't know if Philip Chase does audiobooks either. But uh, I think Heath everyone else too distinguished. Does. You know, he seems too distinguished. I'm Phil not too distinguished. My brain just doesn't follow them. <laughs> if Philip Philip Chase is the kind of guy that you tell him to write a book and he pulls out a pen and paper. <laughs> yeah, Philip Philip's so good though. Oh uh, no, like, I, I, I love yeah. him. I know, yeah. yeah, I know. Like, and I totally agree. He totally would take out a pen and paper. He'd be like, "Oh, let I me just... get started." <laughs> yeah, started, you know, in perfect cursive, like you've never seen your life. Oh, I've never seen his writing, but now that you mentioned, I'm so sure he has perfect cursive. He'd be like, hey, do you want an MLA? Is that how you want me to format? <laughs> uh, it just seems like one of the most pleasant people. Yeah. You ever, like, yeah. You ever meet someone that's so smart? You're like, that's unfair. That's kind yeah. of how I feel about Philip. Yeah. Yeah. Someone said Philip Chase is a trick. You're, you're, you're damn right. You're I've damn never right. seen anyone say something bad about Philip Chase. I feel like it'd be weird to not like think Philip Chase is great. Like, how would you even come to that? Yeah, I mean, Opinion. my whole purpose of bringing him on here was to show people how one how smart he was and just try to get him to laugh. And I succeeded. Uh, it's dragons actually, are awesome. Oh, dude, that was the best. I, I, I'll never I'll never beat that moment. If you haven't watched <laughs> my interview with Philip Chase uh, podcast episode, you should go check it out. It is uh, really, really good. I, I, I will say I think it was it was great. I really it did. was. Um, it was a good time. I got Philip to crack up a little bit. I got him to loosen up a little bit. You know, and I, I, I enjoyed his company quite, uh, quite well. And that's one that we'll, we'll run back. I'll definitely be having him on again because he has a lot that we didn't even get to like half the stuff I had written down that I wanted to quiz him about. So, um, but yeah. Do you have stuff written down for these? Uh, no, but with Philip, I had, I haven't talked to Philip a lot. So, you know, I talk to you, I talk to Christian every day. Um, pretty much everyone that I've had on, I, I've had like personal conversations with, I've had a couple with Philip that didn't pertain to books necessarily. And I wanted to get more from him, uh, specifically his opinions on, and like, I didn't get to ask him, like, how does he assess a book? Like how I kind of asked you, I never got around to that. And we just got, it was basically a Malaz and infomercial and it was, yeah. Awesome. And it, it was, was, it was yeah. awesome. Yeah. He almost got me to start it that night. I, I read the first chapter. I wrote the prologue. Philip uh, is very good at pitching Malazan. Yeah. 
Yeah, Philip, 20 minute monologue why fantasy is beautiful. Jimmy, I like dragons. It was so good. <laughs> it's literally, I'll never, I'll never top it. That was Man, it. It's all downhill from here on booktube. I wish they did it. in Memories of Ice. They said how Stony was handled could have been better. So they said one negative thing about Malazan. So that was uh, AP Canavan, I think. Anyway, AP Canavan, also a great channel. Um, I think my favorite AP Canavan video is he has a really long talk about magic systems and what he thinks like the pros and cons of hard and soft magic systems are hmm. and why people like both. Um, and it's easily, I think, the best video about magic systems on the internet. I gotta um, check it out. It's great. Um, AP makes me feel dumb, but that's not <laughs> his fault. That's my fault. Um, he, great channel. And yeah, couldn't recommend that Magic Systems video enough. He, one of his examples, it somewhat bothered me because this is I, I'm how I'm criticizing one of my favorite videos. But he has an example on Mistborn and he gets some like factual things incorrect about Mistborn and it it's not important. Whatever. Whatever. It's AP Canavan? Uh, his YouTube is a critical dragon. Um, he talks with oh. Philip Chase a lot. Yeah, I think I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's a. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Long videos. Um, you oh, don't goodness. long videos. Um, but really smart guy. Um, he has a prolonged discussion. Oh yeah, he has a lot of prolonged discussions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's an older gentleman. Does does he talk to people? Yeah, he has a bunch, I think, with Philip Chase. Um, I think he had one recently on Yo Yo Johanna's channel, um, who's another booktuber who's great, by the way. Who is it? Uh, I'll put a link to the channel I'm talking about. Actually, I'll just link the video. Um, I'm. Should I have this uh, gentleman on? Should I have Critical Dragon on? The if you can get him, then yes. Um, if uh, I can get him. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, yes, you should, is Listen, the answer. I will headlock anyone who denies. <laughs> um. Uh, critical dragon will convince you as you're headlocking him why headlocking him you is a bad idea and you will remain then be completely convinced on why it's a bad idea to headlock well, you i'm just gonna link his channel the one thing i gotta do you gotta get him before they write a novella or they won't come on <laughs> all right one sec i'm just posting it in the comments here that's a critical dragon um mm -hmm. and are you putting in chat yeah, I literally just put it in the chat there. I don't see it. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to also now put Johanna's video, which is her talk with the Critical Dragon. Oh, yeah. Yo yo uh, Johanna's Literally. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, she's um, great. Anyways, everyone should go subscribe to both of those people. Um, they should come up in a second. I'm fine, too, I guess. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I I've seen a lot of uh, Johanna. Is, uh, is it Johanna, Joanna? I don't know. I would say I'm Joanna. scared to ask. I'm, gonna say, I'm sick of a Joanna. Uh, yeah, I like Joanna's videos quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, they're really good. Yeah, they're really, um, really good. She did the no disclaimer tag and she had my favorite no disclaimer tag anyway. Which one? What, um, what, what was it? Give me some spoilers, bro. For the no disclaimer tag? Okay. So it was, um, I kind of said the same thing, man, for uh, which books do you find overrated? And she kind of agrees with me and thinks overrated is a somewhat weird word to use to describe books. Um, and that she kind of feels like she's telling people they're wrong for enjoying things mm -hmm. um, when they, I, and that's how I feel. Like when I say, if I say something's overrated, I feel like I'm telling people they're wrong for liking someone. So even though I don't like best of cold, I don't think I've ever said it's overrated. And if I did, I didn't mean to. Yeah. I, I actually, I actually don't like the term overrated either. Yeah. I mean, either. I, for I something very hard not to use it. I think I've probably used it by accident in Discord chat. I but, did earlier, like in my yeah. booktuber career uh, or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't like it either. I agree with you. Yeah, like because what it really means is lots of people like this series and I don't. Like that's I, what you yeah, really you mean. But overrated like implies how much people like something is more than they should like it. Which yeah. seems silly to me. The only way you could like maybe kind of discern that is like a dollar amount on what the series is made. But like, do you really want to go down that rabbit hole? You know, like I don't, it's not even then, like if you were to say like the dollar amount, you would to say it's overrated, you would then have to say the dollar amount it deserves. And how are you going to quantify that? Yeah, but, but actually, this this is something I want to talk about. Uh, it's been on my mind like all week. Um, everybody, I think we can have this conversation. Everyone coming close. You know, we've been on for three hours, but we're still going strong. Because this is important. Folks, when you see someone post something 
on let's just say Twitter. And you know, it's for a series you hate, but somebody else really likes it. You don't always you you really don't. You don't always have to tweet and say, "Oh, I thought that series sucked." You don't have to do it. It's not mandatory. It does it's not constructive. Um and it's it's puts the person who loves the thing in a very awkward position because it's not they they're generally not tweeting something for a debate. They're not tweeting something to have a conversation. In in 180 characters or whatever it is on Twitter now, 280, uh it's not a good place to have that kind of dialogue. And it drives me up a wall whenever people do that to me. And then when I see people do those other things, obviously I'm not the biggest Mistborn fan in the world. When the Mistborn Fortnite skin came out, I don't like Fortnite either. And I don't like Mistborn. I was thrilled for people who wanted that. I was thrilled because that's awesome. You know, that'd be like if someone made a fit skin and stuck it in battlefield or something like, or call it. I'd be like, Oh man, that's the cool. I mean, that'd be a really weird matchup, but go with me here. Yeah. We know what um, you mean. So, I, I just, you know, and I saw that. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like, that that's great for people. And I saw people, like, who don't like Mistborn are like, oh, yeah, of course it'd go to Fortnite. Fortnite sucks. And it's like, it's okay to let people enjoy something. It's yeah. also okay if someone doesn't understand why you don't like something that is so beloved. Like, it's okay. Like, when people are like, I don't like reading Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is terrible. I don't, like, I, I don't really care. Now, if they said... Could you t explain to me why you like it? Or like we're like if Jake right now said J.R. Tolkien is a garbage to your writer, we could have a discussion because this is the right type of like place to have that discussion. Uh, but I am just like so tired <laughs> of tweeting stuff and then someone being like, oh, Farseer is boring. And I'm just like, am I like, am I supposed to be like, oh, my God, you're right. I should have never posted this. Yeah. Like, it, it it, or this happened um so it's youtube comments as well this actually happened on my tigana review someone commented like tigana is actually just really like mediocre mediocre and boring and i'm like <laughs> i guess i sorry i was wrong like yeah what do you want me to say like yeah you know your comment has convinced me i actually don't like tigana now yeah it, it, and to be fair there are times where people will comment on my videos which is fine and they'll say, oh, I actually, I didn't really, this didn't hit with me because of this, this, and this. And I go, oh, that's actually like interesting. You know, that was really important to you. Like, I'm not saying that you can't have a discord, uh, a disagreement and then have good discourse about that. But I like, for instance, on my malice video for John Wen, I remember there was a, con I think it was that it was like a comment. It was just like, this book was uh, short, choppy and sucked. And I'm just like, well said. Well said. Anyway, but, Pranav, don't worry. We're actually complaining about Farseer hate, not hating Farseer. It's fine. <laughs> anyway. Oh, man. it It's the legend. <laughs> it's the legend. Just woke up and referred Farseer oh, hate. We got Dylan and Pranav. Did someone post this in, like, social of Alex's uh, Discord or something? I nope, hope they so. Just, they just both happened to find it at the same time. All right. I didn't realize the last year, but it's still going <laughs> uh, dylan you were even mentioned earlier like at the very beginning when we talked about project hail mary he was one of the people who um loved project hail mary um and then the other was nick who they disagree a lot nick and dylan very rarely agree uh so when both of them liked it i was like oh anyway yeah um but 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 to the point like there's a difference between responding with an opinion and responding and, and i'm not yeah. saying people can't have their opinion and can't state it but it's like really odd where people think they're entitled to a debate with you because you love something and they don't. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's weird. And yeah, and it's it's also like when when some people are like having discussion about whether a book was good, um, the part that's pointless to argue about is like the reading experience that someone had. Like so you also you don't like well of ascension yeah it would be ridiculously pointless for me to be like you know how you were bored during well of ascension well i'm gonna trick you into actually you weren't <laughs> bored and you were enjoying it now if you were to say like oh there's this plot hole in mistborn and i was actually there's a bit of like missing information you had and i was like oh no that's explained with that that actually could feasibly change your mind and be like okay that isn't a plot hole yeah but like i'm not gonna change the emotions you felt while reading well of ascension it's not gonna happen yeah, and I think um, usually those emotions are founded. I do think you can grow as a reader over time, and a piece of uh, you know fantasy or whatever fiction can can mean something different to you later down the road. I think that's totally fair. I think that's why rereading can be a very valuable experience. 
Um, but you know, someone said, Oh, well, if Cinch is one of the best things, and I said, Yeah, it sure is. Like, you know, it doesn't yeah. have to be dogmatic. And I don't know, it just it it drives me crazy when something happens for a fandom and people root again. I see people rooting against like Shadow and Bone because it's YA. And like that's I, 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 don't get me wrong, you can hate it, you can say it sucked, you know, like, that's all fine. Cause guess what? It's not my cup of tea. But I'm so happy for those people, you know. Yeah. Like it's always weird to cheer for someone not to enjoy something. I remember uh yeah. pre Best Serve Cold talk, uh Bookborn in one of her videos mentioned like, oh, we need to have a talk about Best Serve Cold. And I was like, you know, hopefully it's because you disagree with me and enjoyed it. And she's like, Well, no, I'm I'm closer to you on this one. And I was like, Oh, that's it. And it's like obviously. If someone doesn't like Best Serve Cold, I'm kind of like, hey, I have company. But I never cheer for someone to like not enjoy reading a book. That just yeah. feels mean. Yeah, it, it's it's okay if a lot of people like something and you don't like it. I, I guess that's that's what I'm trying to get across, especially on. And I'm really just complaining about Twitter because every time I post something about Realm of the Elderlings, like every other time, it's like, oh, far series like is, boring series. Our forward slash fantasy is so annoying for this lately. Like. They seem to have this thing where someone will be like, I enjoyed this book. And all the top comments will people saying like, there's so many comments of like, oh, it's not actually good. Like, you know, the only books that are allowed to be good are like, there's only like five. Yeah, there's a golden scroll. Now, here's some, one thing that will help you out a lot with r slash fantasy. On I stopped going there. Well, that really helped. God damn it. That was my punchline, Jake. I stole it. Get wrecked. Listen, I am. I am Robert Jordan. You are oh, Tolkien. I stole it. <laughs> Listen, you can't be stealing my punchlines. All right. God, I can't even at you on YouTube and you're taking my punch. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I, I've left this on the screen because I am biased. and I think Zane is the worst character of all time. And yeah, Emo Assassin, <laughs> how original. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Who would be my least favorite character of all time? I've read worse than uh, Zane, I think. Um, I see your Dane, Zane, and I raise you the non-King Killer Denna, but the Wizard's First Rule Denna. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, you angry. don't want to learn. You but, don't want to learn. Trust me. It's. Um, I will tell you. I think every character in the Raven Tower by Anne Lecky is are the worst characters. It's the worst story I've ever read. It's literal garbage. Oh, Alan, if you don't believe me that this character's worse, you you got to trust. Like it's not even close, wow. De man. Um. So, Denna for Wizard's first rule. Um. Let's explain what Denna's character is. So Denna um, is a, a woman who's not considered a good person and, of course, wears a very tight leather outfit and uh, tortures the main character a lot until the main character eventually starts to like Denna. And it's not like the torturing where it's like, you know, torture when they don't listen and then, like, you know, encourage good behavior. Um, like, it's not like, I forget what they're called, the bands the Sean, Sean Chow have. It's just... Just torture. That and sounds it's, terrible. It's, it, it's like making Glotka a romancer. It's kind of silly. Yeah, so it'd be like, yeah, it'd be like if Glotka was torturing someone, and then the plot was like, you're from the person being tortured, and they fall in love with Glotka. You're like, man, it's starting to get a little hot in here. Hmm. Yeah. Give me one of them gummy kisses you got, Glotka. Although, you know, Glotka doesn't have that, uh, Glotka doesn't have that tight leather, uh, tight leather clothing. <laughs> but we could get him. Uh, we could make him some tight leather clothing. I think that would work. Honestly... I think Matt from Wheel of Time is one of the worst characters I've ever read. You're incorrect. Dude, I, I hate Matt so much. I know that's not popular, so I'm just putting it out there just to see how bad I get flamed for that. But like, I legitimately hate Matt so much. Uh, I do love a Gwen. Gwen's great. That's something. Let's see. Uh, Alan says Zane is a war crime against good characters. Sanderson served 10 years in an international <laughs> prison for writing him. That's where he wrote Steelheart. True story. It's also where he got the idea for Khaled in a moon suit. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it, man. You're pushing that? Okay. That's All where right. he wrote Steelheart. <laughs> Matt is fun. Yeah. Uh, fun if you like nails across a chalkboard. No, I'm just kidding. Matt is Matt is one of the few characters who I could read about doing nothing and enjoy it. Uh, I love I'm Matt. super glad that people love him. Um, uh, Chief, we just had a big conversation. We're not using the word overrated anymore. We banned it. Jake said no more. He said there's no such thing as overrated. Yeah, well, I didn't ban it, but I said I think it's kind of... Yep, he banned it. Okay, it's banned now. Um, I don't know if no disclaimer means Harry Dresden or Harry Potter, but I either agree or disagree. 
Harry Potter is the least interesting character in his story. That's true. Yeah. It's all the side characters that make it. Chief Cancel Matt is awesome. Yeah. See, good no, job for now. You know what, Noel? I know we don't agree on Mistborn, but I think we agree on like 99% of things. So you're you're now you're you're now in my uh top tier list, S tier. All right, no disclaimer clarified Potter. Good stuff. Not Dresden. Okay, Very good. good. No disclaimer continues with the good takes, hence the lack of need for a disclaimer. Um, overhyped. Overhype's a weird one, too. I mean, overhype, I think, is less weird. I, th- but... I think you could make a better argument for the word overhyped. Yeah, for sure. Um, like if someone tells you, like, this is the grandest fantasy of all time and it's like done, it's a slice of life in one location featuring like one side character, you'd be like, okay, this was a little overblown, right? Like that, that you yeah, could do that. Overhyped would be. If the people who just are like, if you drew a bell curve of enjoyment, um, if the people at the very end of that bell curve who completely love it um, said just to everyone, like that, it's going to be your favorite series ever. No question. Like, yeah, it's going to ruin it. Then that would be like overhyped. There's nothing um, worse than when something gets overhyped to you. Nothing worse. Yeah, I get there's definitely there's um there's some. People who say like Malazan will ruin other books for you, and like after you read Malazan, you can't compare other books to Malazan. Um, and then I responded with, "I'm gonna compare other books to Malazan. Like, don't fight <laughs> fight me because you know the book that I read two books after the Crippled God was fucking Ship of Magic. And you know what? It's better than I like. It. Yeah, I like it more than every Malazan book. And that's followed up by the Mad Ship, which I like more than every Malazan book. Which was then followed up by Ship of Destiny, which I like more than every Malazan book, as well as Fool's Errand. I like. Yeah a few Malaz and Bucks were in Golden Fool. Anyway. There's also like uh, association with books that can be really dangerous that ends up in overhype. Like I had so many people tell me what books to read after Song of Ice and Fire that had nothing to do with the Song of Ice and Fire. Didn't even have the same tones, uh, you know, and, and then you get into why you like the series and that kind of stuff. So I think overhype kind of goes well with that. I think it's quantifiable in that uh, regard. Um, I mean, I think I, I don't get mad when people say the Cosmere, when people say the Cosmere's overhyped even though for me it's correctly hyped but it's if you hype it to people who aren't going to care about the cosmere connections like they would care about the cosmere connections then it ends up overhyped well yeah and also you have to realize that a lot of times what happens and it's it's kind of funny this does happen on reddit is someone is like hey first time reader i just read stormlight it was my favorite thing i'm I'm so blown away by it they they just created the reddit account you know, they got the gall to finally type in this comment. It meant so much to them that they wanted to start interacting with the community. And the first thing they see is Sanderson's overhyped and sucks. And you're like, yeah, how do they, they can't, they don't know that. You know what I mean? That's just so silly to me. I think, so our forward slash fantasy, I think the same thing is now happening to Stormlight that happened yeah. uh, to a song of ice and fire on our forward slash fantasy. And I'm going to see if it goes back. Cause if um, a song of ice and fire used to get shit on a lot on our forward slash fantasy and stormlight was praised a lot. And now um, it's kind of, it it's gotten out of the phase where like the people who don't like a song of ice and fire, because once a series gets super popular, the number of people who don't like it will increase because percentages Um, they've kind of gotten over hating on things that other people don't like. Um, So they've stopped. So now it's mostly the people talking about A Song of Ice and Fire are the people mm-hmm. who really like A Song of Ice and Fire. And I'm pretty sure that's probably going to happen with Stormlight as well, where the people who don't like it will just get over themselves and stop going to every comment that likes Stormlight and saying, like, you're wrong. It's actually just vapid and empty entertainment. You didn't get anything meaningful out of it. Um, and your opinion is bad. So I think that's going to blow over. But whatever. I'd just way rather talk about books on Discord than Reddit. So, yeah, whatever. I'd agree. Uh, Jimmy, I thought you had good opinions. Nope, just opinions. Just opinions. <laughs> um, good, good Hob opinions. Yes, we have talked a lot about Robin Hob tonight. Um, yes. And all says after rereading Harry Potter, it's not, I think he is terrible. I agree. Nynaeve is the best character in real time. What's going on here? I actually like Nynaeve. I've liked Nynaeve from the get go. She's the only person that made sense why she was so frustrated. Everybody else was just bickering and i could funny because um nynaeve was the slow burn character that i loved in that i think you're at the end of you just finished book five um yeah. i think if you asked me after book five nynaeve would be pretty low on my character rankings and then she kind of just slowly trends up over time yeah um, someone also spoiled the ending for me so yeah the chances of me finishing that series now are very slim so it's unfortunate <laughs> 
Yeah, there's something. Uh, this is specifically a Wheel of Time thing, by the way. Uh, you have a reader, and they're bi- they're a big fan, and they will react to your early reaction to a character being introduced, and by their reaction, give away everything that's going to happen with that character, and it's very frustrating. <laughs> like you like this character? No way! And it's like, well, I just met them, so yeah, I kind of enjoyed the intro. <laughs> You know, now I know they're going to be uh, a poo poo head in books to come. So it's not 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 the best, uh, but I'm also super sensitive to spoilers. So there is that. Uh, no Slimmer says, who are some underrated characters? Uh, I mean, we could do this all night. Kithrin from the Dagger and the Coin is one of my favorite protagonists, as well as Wester, uh, which is another character in there. And also um, not Harold um, uh, Genner. I always forget his name. Because it's been a while since. Right? Basically, I think the dagger and the coin cast is extraordinarily underrated. And then I would also say, um, I really think Davos is actually underrated. Song of Ice and Fire that we talked about on tonight. What about you, Jake? What do you think? Uh, I'm going to say what Chief said in the comments. Uh, Mizaki is absolutely a correct pick. She's so yes. good. One of the best um, protagonists of all time. Yeah, so good. Um, she'll, I think, be on my top character list that I'm going to make soon. Um, I'm going to pick Fidelius from Alara. I'm going to pick. I'm looking at my bookshelf now. Um, who else have we got? I'm going to pick Finry from the first law. Uh, hmm. I love Finry. Um, who else? I mean, we could make a, a yeah, list so of 100 many. people. Yeah. What's up, Matt Brown? Matt, Matt's been a loyal subscriber for a long time. Comments on like every single one of my videos. Uh, been a pretty, pretty much a pillar of the community since like, like 200 subs or something. Good to see you, man. I'm glad you could finally make it. We we've been going for almost three and a half hours. Yeah. Wait, am I the longest chatting with nuts? Does that I, mean I win? I think you are officially. Yes. Yeah. Does that mean I win? What's my prize? Yeah. I mean, I I I don't know. Maybe to come back. I don't know. That seems okay. good. Also, you're gonna be famous after this because you're a oh sellout. oh yeah. I forgot about that. You can yeah. get a free co- uh arc of my novella. All right. Oh, um, great. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin Kahn says, with hundreds of things on a TBR, how in the world do you choose what's next? Uh, so I actually kind of have a schedule this year. It was pretty loose. It was like, I need to read these things. And unfortunately, I'm now at halfway in the year. And I'm like, oh, I still have like eight things <laughs> that I said I was going to read that I haven't read. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of a mood reader, I guess. What about you, Jake? How do you how do you figure out your next read? Do you just go with the I phone? pick just with somewhat randomness to start with. Um, in general right now, I think what I'm kind of settling on is I'm getting some big series that are very set, um, whether they be rereads or new reads. And then I'm going to kind of just read whatever I feel like picking up in between those. So like I I knew I was going to go through Rama, the Elderlings, um, and I was kind of alternating with stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, you know, in early 2022, I'm going to read the expanse, but I'm not going to super like plan out what I'm reading in between expanse books. I'm going to alternate expanse, something else, expanse, something else. Um, people tell me to read stuff faster all the time. And what I always say is, or read things first yeah. is that all those requests actually perfectly cancel out and so nothing <laughs> changes. Yeah. I, I feel you. There, there, there are some times where someone will catch me on a mood and then like legitimately the recommendation will like move up. Uh, for instance, honestly, uh, Robin hop, like, Robin Hobb was definitely someone I kept putting off, kept putting off, kept putting off. And then one day Chris Bookish Coulter caught me in the right mood and it was a wrap. I yeah, I mean, Project Hail Mary is the one that moved up quite a lot for me um, recently. But yeah. like usually when someone says add this to the TBR, it's very, very easy to get me to add something to the TBR. Tell me mm-hmm. to add it. I'll go to the Goodreads. I'll click want to read. Getting me to move it up from like spot 200 takes quite a bit more than that. I generally, there are lots of people who I learn the book opinions of um, and I go based on that in general um yeah like me and my awesome channel yeah yeah exactly you're you're one of them um it's rare i'll move something up based on one person liking a book as soon as i see two people who i tend to agree with really like something um so let's uh, give an example you're the only one i've heard talk about the combat codes hasn't been enough to move it up my tbr let's say alan goes and reads the combat codes and says oh yeah it's amazing then i'll then i'll like i'll start moving it up yeah that's fair that's definitely fair. Also, a book length has a lot to do with it. Just getting thrown in randomly. Like sometimes it just has to have a fit or a mood. Um, I, I kind of want to address this real quick. Uh, I said, how did you get spoiled? It, it was from just people 
uh, kind of giving me expectation spoilers and then like actually just divulging information and in tweets, which sucked. Um, they weren't even necessarily uh, aimed at me and I actually muted Wheel of Time spoilers. They just didn't mark it. Uh, but I don't know everything that happens at the Wheel of Time, but I know uh, for I've had three of my favorite characters from Wheel of Time uh, spoiled essentially and where they end up. And it's just like, well, I don't care anymore. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's not that I won't ever finish it, but it, it is what it is. Um, yeah, it'd be impressive to spoil everything in the Wheel of Time. That would be hard. Yeah, there's there's too many things, right? Uh, yeah. Yasna and Daenerys are coming. I love Yasna. Yeah, I same. Yasna. I'm looking forward to getting more Yasna. Yeah, Davos sure. is one of the only sensible people Westeros. He wants to go instead of killing people. You're right. Alan has called you out. He said he will chat with nuts for 10 hours. Al Alan, if you're in for in the next uh, two weeks from now, if you're in, I'm in. We'll All right, Alan, this is what I'd like to request you do, Jimmy. I need you to just cut off the chat with Alan at one minute shorter than ours. All right, we'll see. It depends on, uh, you know, who rates my novella that I'll eventually write. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> five stars for sure. I'm already a sellout, apparently. I might as well actually get something for it. Baba uh, says, I don't reckon Davos is underrated as he never really seen him being viewed as overrated most of the time. He's I think he's well beloved, but like, you like, I don't know. I never hear people like, hey, Davos is my favorite character from A Song of Ice and Fire. And I think he plays like a really important role considering that we see Stannis, the manis from his point of view. I think like, I think he just has such an important role and I kind of like, uh, like the fact that we mentioned above, like we know his motivations. The dude just wants to go home. He just wants to serve his King, mm -hmm. give you some onions, go home. Um, so it's not so much that I think people hate him or anything like that, but it's just like, I don't know if he gets enough credit for what he does for that narrative. It sounds like sense. Davos, you know, sometimes he does heroic things, but always reluctantly, you know? Yeah. Shut <laughs> Ah, oh, Jake, who invited you? Long <laughs> I don't know. It was a bad it. decision. <laughs> yeah, Long Price. I, I know Chief has been reading it and saying really good things. Um, I really got to get the dagger and coins. Yeah, you do. Uh, it's, Long, it's excellent. Yeah. Long Price actually went higher, even though I don't know that many people have read it. Because also, like, why people like it is important as well. Um, yeah, yeah, that's so. Yeah. Uh, Alan seems to really like a lot of like action pack books. So when Alan likes a really slow burn. I take that as it's a really good slow burn. Yeah, Daniel uh, Abraham's weird, man, because like you, you we're saying slow burn, but it's like it's not. It, like he moves the story along. There's just not a lot of action. How is it so low rated on Goodreads? People are people are weird. Okay, <laughs> I've had so many people tell me like that. The dagger and the coin is miserable. Like, how can you even get through Dragon's Path? I don't agree at all. Now, what I will say, Dragon's Path is a good book. Whereas I think the rest of them are great books. Tyrant's Law is amazing. Such a good book. Such a good conclusion. And I need someone to read it so I can talk to somebody about it. Well, Alan got to me first. So I'm reading a long price quartet before Dagger That's and the fine. Coin. Publication order is fine. Uh, Patrick is reading uh, The Dagger and the Coin. And I'm really excited to talk to him about it. Okay, Alan, omnibuses are always rated much higher because no one goes to an omnibus to give it a one star review. People only review one omnibus as a series they like. Yeah, Alan, we're gonna we're gonna have to do. <laughs> I disagree with um, literally almost every hey it's... No, that's not true. You both love Discord Discworld. But it's that's good like because favorite. then you know if Alan likes a book, there's a good chance that you can pass on it. So it's good. It's good to surround yourself. I don't know if Prunov does disagree as much with Alan as he said. They both have Pratchett as like a top two favorite author of all time. We all intersect at some point. If you read enough anyway, books, we all intersect. Alan was funny because when Alan started his um, YouTube, he started by loving Great Coats and really disliking the Rage of Dragons. Well, at the same time, I was loving the Rage of Dragons and really disliking Great Coats. Um, so I thought we disagreed on like everything. Um, and then we've slowly started agreeing more and more. It turns out <laughs> that people aren't just in one camp or the yeah. other. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think Pranav and Alan, I don't even think they disagree on like much at all. It's they're kind of weird. And like for inter series ranking, I feel like they always disagree. Like if you ask them, what's the best Malazan book, mm -hmm. um, they're going to disagree. But if you ask them what's a good series, they're gonna agree. Yeah, I mean that's fair. I think it's I think it's good to find common ground. It's also good to talk to people you don't that you don't agree with on books because sometimes it's a, like for me and Chris Booker's Cauldron, I can recommend him a book and he's probably not gonna like it. If he recommends me a book, I love it. Like he's recommended me this Jacqueline Carey series, and I want to get to it so bad. It sounds so good. 
Hey, and yeah, no disclaimer, I love Rage of Dragons. Um, I basically, my opinion on Rage of Dragons is Jimmy's opinion on Faithful of the Fallen. In that I wow. like all, it, it's almost reversed. I basically like Faithful of the Fallen as much as you like Rage of Dragons. And I like Rage of Dragons as much as you like Faithful of the Fallen. I mean, I like Rage of Dragons quite a bit. I thought Fire's Vengeance. I like, I like Faithful of the Fallen quite a bit as well. That's good. Um, where it's like you said, basically Faithful of the Fallen gets you instantly invested in the characters. So I felt about Tau. And all the non-Tau people. Um, anyways, hey, as I said, Pranav, you like the same series, just not in the same order. <laughs> Kushal's Dart was interesting from what I've read. Yeah, I heard book two gets way better. Um, and then book three, uh, I mean, Chris says it's one of his favorite books of all time. So, uh, it, it's weird. Like I said, when Chris recommends me something, like he recommended me Hob, like steadily. And when I finally listened to him and I listened to him on some other stuff, it's all been like super high rated for me. So it's cool to have those people that, you know, you can rely on for Rex, you know? Yes, that is true. Um, so one great thing about disc, uh, discord, um, and getting to know so many people and like, not just what books they like, but why they like books. Um, and you kind of know, like when someone, there's some people like when they give a review and I can tell whether I'll like a book pretty accurately. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have the people that you, that you can go to and know what you're going to get. So, all right. It's been three and a half hours. I I'm tapping out. I'm yeah. Tapping out. I'm, I think we're starting to run out of steam. I got you to, I sold you on butcher. So that, that was actually the only reason I was here. All this other stuff was just a means to an end. Um, so I'm, mission accomplished. You know? I mean, I'm usually in bed by this time, so this is impressive. Um, it's, you, it's a wild 8.05 p.m. for me. So Yeah, you got a lot to go. Hey, everyone in chat, thanks so much. We, ha we had a great audience tonight. I think we had uh, some good discussions, and it's always really nice to bounce ideas off chat. And then for you guys to ask us questions, I thought it was excellent. Um, chat was great. Yeah, it's always so much fun. It's always so much fun. Jake, I really appreciate you, and I, I, I kind of... I feel like I did a disservice because I usually go over a lot of the things that I enjoy uh, about my guest channel, but we just kept talking and talking and talking that I never really got to say this. But uh, for those of you who watch me and have not watched Jake, the reason why I have Jake on one, because he's a good guy and I really like talking to him. But two is Jake has one of like the most criminally underviewed channels, in my opinion. And I don't mean that to disparage Jake or anything like that. But Jake is, you know, started out on BookTube. And he's one of the ones I consistently go to. And when he posts a review, I watch it. And I can never understand why he doesn't have thousands upon thousands of uh, subscribers. Baffles um, me as well. I know. You know, <laughs> I'm so humble. humble as well. So humble. Like, but, you know. But uh, in, in sincerity, Jake, I, I really enjoy your reviews. I think uh, if you're someone who's watching this right now and you prefer like longer form reviews that are spoiler free, I don't know. If there's anyone as good as Jake is uh, when it comes to pointing out very specific things about books, like he doesn't have those broad sweeps uh, that, that a lot of us end up doing because we want to stay spoiler free. I think Jake does an excellent job of drawing parallels from other works, uh, whether it be books, movies, anything else. Uh, I really appreciate that. I, yeah, I've, I've always really appreciated your analogies, and I think that you do a very fair job of representing the material that you digest. And I think uh, that you will one day be at a couple thousand subscribers easily uh so then so, i can sell out yes. yeah it's very important you sell you hit three thousand subs make a patreon uh which i'm not dumping anyone has patreon but uh and then write a novella and then don't respond to my uh <laughs> questions of coming on the show and then you're good levels <laughs> of salt are rising it's all it's all just in good fun it's all yes fun. don't ever see it um that's yeah, true. Jake, Jake is excellent. Go check out his channel. Hit subscribe on his channel. Go check out his videos. I think he's stupendous. And Jake, thank you so much for giving me three and a half hours of your time. Yeah. I, I feel like I probably don't need to say Jimmy Nuts' channel is great because presumably everyone is watching this video. So uh, presumably you all know about his channel. But your channel's great too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good message to end it on. We should. Uh, that should be the thumbnail. Yeah, um, you Dylan saying sellout. <laughs> through the dresden thumbnail that dresden i love that dresden art though anyways cool is there any uh social media you want to plug or anything where the people can find you i don't really do much other than i have youtube and goodreads um i technically have a twitter but i don't really use it much cool but uh, i guess i can check out my goodreads i also post reviews of books there 
Um, yeah, if you want very specific numerical ratings, I think I think uh, everyone should be uh, checking out your channel after this uh, awesome talk. So, hey, everyone, have a great weekend. Uh, thank you for spending so long because uh, we've yeah. been really consistent with our viewer count. It's crazy to me. I'll be back in two weeks. I think my guest is going to be Alan. Uh, is That'll Alan? Alan is cool with coming on. Uh, and I also think I, uh, I'm going to talk to Steven Arian. Uh, I think that's how you say his name. He's uh, the author of The Coward and also of Battle Mage. Uh, there's some other people that I have uh, coming and down the pipe. Rhythm oh, will be on the channel. Oh, that'll be good as well, yeah. yeah. Hopefully Alan lasts 10 hours because then I can actually catch some of it because if it's only like an hour and a half or two hours, I won't be able to catch any of it. So hopefully he's right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll go long. We'll go long for you. Um, go 10 hours. I want promise and payoff, okay? Promise yeah, and payoff. Know yep so it looks like alan will be coming on but yeah everyone thank you so much i'm gonna let you go have a good weekend be safe be good until i see you again make sure to always you know you know how it goes keep turning the page love you